Good evening. This is Jonathan Albert, and we are uh, embarking today on a slightly different tangent of our Sage Advice portion. Yes, we're going to do some world building, but we're going to be talking about, not talking about process today, we're going to talk about actually doing the thing. I found that recently my uh, efforts have been misunderstood or whatever, and so, anyway, we're not going there, so, I, I, wow, let's try it. A different beginning. Take two. Take two. Great games in the morning. This is Jonathan Albin. This is world building. Let's get after it. Okay? Go. All right. So when we build a world, when we create a new environment for role play, this place that we're building by necessity only has to exist for the duration of the time of the story that we're telling. I, for example, tend to tell long, long tail stories, which means the adventure is going to take several months or whatever. And so I do a, a greater amount of upfront creation. And then I draw that creation back to the background so that I can continue to go forward with the story without spending a lot of time re-establishing it or re redefining it each moment. Some persons that when they tell the story, they want a uh, physical change to occur when you go from position to position, and so they're more mercurial, uh, spontaneous in their world creation. And that process can be bone-jarring for a persona that's living in their world if they're not able to tap into something consistent or constant behind it. So by establishing parameters for existence and then leaving that alone after that to make it the stable background that it should be or needs to be, um, you afford the players the opportunity to actually discover very, the varieties, the changes in weather, changes in environment, which includes weather, so green goes top of mind some time since. And people have said that I have not been very communicative or specific, and so I want to make sure that I afford the opportunity for those of you that are viewing to experience the process. So today we're going to be looking at a use of uh, what I have now called sort of defining as the nesting doll development process. It's the same method that I use for the actual process of world building that I'm going to talk about using uh, world build. The background, world build, the universe, uh, at it's at the uh, at the higher level. So as you move, like a slide trombone, as you move out or in, as you change the pitch of the of the adventure, change the uh, you're able to find it. And then, of course, the uh, that was that the uh, and then of course the roll roll pitch. Hard to explain. Anyway, <laughs> kind of like everything else I do, I've got to find a way to make it more difficult. It seems like a characteristic, and perhaps uh, maybe maybe you'll find that interesting because the decomplexification, the undoing of that difficult process, is really what my exploration path is about. I've got to find a way to connect have what I say make sense or mean something, and I know it means something, I feel it, I, I, I experience it, but if you as a viewer 
can't also see it, then and so be it. Alrighty, so first of all, we need to reestablish the nesting doll mechanism. And we had a name, I'm probably going to mess it up. But uh, we had a player from uh, Middle Europe, up in Northern Middle Europe, or I think it was Northern Europe, uh, called it uh, Arishko. Am I saying that right? And it's the nesting doll, the idea of a small doll like shape inside of another die sized shape that break apart in the center so they can apart. put the next doll inside and you put the doll outside and the doll outside of that. So you get a much taller final product with the key being inserted with many, many inside. So, uh, when, while we're doing this, I, I realize we're probably going to be in the same situation we've been before that uh, nobody wants to see my ugly mug. So let me go ahead and uh, if I can adjust the screen to include kind of another map like usual because it seems like it's something a that can be done and now i can actually do it for uh oh can't be on that don't be showing that Alrighty. No, that's not yet. Not there yet. Uh, yeah, that that was it. Back, back it. Here we go. All righty. So, when we talk about the, uh, this nesting doll, let's talk about the outermost doll, that which should be defined for the longest distance away. So we're going to be creating in this square space a physical map and it's got to be something that we can uh, alter and adjust so paper is futile uh, ground texture is futile yeah I want to try something try paper on paper and By the uniform setting. Uh, that's continent. Okay, so it's not. There we go. One more time. That's interesting. Let's go ahead and change our water level a bit. What's really funny is that often I look at maps and the first thing I try to do is see if it looks anything like our real map. And since we're talking about a new universe, realize that when I say 
you want to scale out as far as possible. It's really a dependent on whether or not where it, the, the key to the map is can, how far can you go from one position in the world to another position in the world. Can you literally sail around the world? Can you actually um, reach other places in the world? All right, so we're going to go with this concept. And one thing that has never been done in the history of, of the world of Nikos is anybody passing the equator. And so those of you that are watching right now in this moment are the only ones that are going to know what that, that's what this map is for. Because uh, as I'm on the channel, if you will, by myself, there's no one watching. Unless you watch this far into the video, you'll never know that that's what this map is. Except that I'll do some things to make it a little clearer, more obvious. So, oh, oh. That is bizarre. Okay, we're good. Let's move off of this setting so that we don't actually put that up. We want to. Start changing the coloration. I think we did. First size, we don't matter because this is we're gonna white wall paint the entire ocean. Those of you, of course, that know the story of Nikos, know why it, it dark red color. I may actually change this together. All right, so there it's been painted now as far as the tone of it. It's step it up a little further. There we go. Remember, the oceans are known as the black water because the water at distance from the land is not accessible because normally you have to worry about uh, cellar navigation and there hasn't been any. And as we just discussed, we also now know that what we're talking about in this case is... Coastline color. Salmon. There we go. Alrighty, so now going with the naming conventions of the north doesn't make any sense because we are south of and since we are now on the Antarctic, I mean the Arctic, the, the, the southern hemisphere and below the radar system, but the northern hemisphere knows we'll have to decide orientation, go to symbols. 
right off the bat and determine where that center is. And we will choose a marker. For the south. There's all the letters. That's got a northern identifier. Can't get rid of that. Maybe this one. Oh, I like the fact that it's in sixes. That's that's very good. Oh. Oh, I remember I can do this. Okay. And then we go to overlay, I think it was. Pattern. No, that's too many. That's too few, that's too many. That's too few. Okay. That's exciting. That's that's indeed inciting. So now the next thing we need to do is to look at our uh, general coloration. All right, I got to figure out a coloration to put it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know why. We're over water, so it won't put the ice. That's okay. That's okay. We do want to increase our brush size anyway to capture the concept. That how much we want. A lot of trackless wastes. Ooh, of snow. It's that it says crypathy though. Uh, it's just back up. Greetings, welcome, and felicitations. This is not Earth, obviously. Yeah, see you later, bye. Yeah, yeah, there he goes. <laughs> That's funny. You're a funny guy. You're a funny guy. No, I'm actually working on uh, a super secret project that nobody's ever seen before. This is the, the southern hemisphere of Nikos. The no one has ever sailed the Blackwater because of the uh, inability to s stellarly navigate because there were no stars. But now that we're three hundred years into the uh, three hundred years into the future, after the arrival of the star pattern in the skies, I figure they're going to start looking at us uh, at stellar navigation, which means eventually crossing that threshold. And considering we're talking 12,000 years that no one's ever gone, gone south, this is my equivalent of the, like, the Piri Reese map. Are you familiar with that story? 
Have you heard of the Piri Reef map? Oh wow! Wow! Yeah, no, the uh, in the uh, fifteen. Shh. Yes, and everyone to own their own hex. Yes, come one, come all to enjoy the uh, festivities at the ball. Yes. But, um, it's not, it's not necessarily, necessarily that, it's that, uh, realizing, Well, the reason I go into the yellow is the photosynthetics on Nikos are different. So since the, or the grasses are going to be a different color as well because the seas are different, the optimal color for things should be yellow. That's what the coloration of your plants would be if you have red light source. So your grasses are going to be yellowish. So... This concept to try to get to a general circular shape compared to the center point. Obviously, more to the left than I am to the right. I think that may be where the continent. Yeah, it is because the the equate the, the, the ah okay that does make sense. It's it back. Yes, that that's the oh, oh that's yeah the yeah, I'm gonna. I have to find a way to shade that or the paint to change the water to white center because of ice. So this can be a pole. Uh, it depends on who your dancer is, what your pole looks like. Yeah, whether how it also depends on how how good good, good looking they are, how solid your pole will be as well. <laughs> oh, that was horrible. That was awful. I should be shot for that. That was awful. Oh dear. Uh, pick a color, any color. White. Water. Color. Well, that's only if you don't actually uh, ever go there, right? Because a map is just empty space until it's identified. The reason why you, as a matter of fact, when I was talking about the Piri Reese map, that's exactly what we're talking about, is that in the case of the Piri Reese map, the, uh, the creator of the map was able to apparently fairly accurately outline Antarctica about... 300 to 500 years before it was actually officially discovered. 
And the question becomes, well, did he create it early or did, or did his, uh, was he in a different experiential place than most in that he, the uh, pole wasn't actually covered by ice at the time? Because right now you can't, you can't see the coastline of Antarctica because it's got an ice shelf that goes all the way around it for the most part, unevenly so. Right, right. And, and yeah, and well, it, it, it apparently it looks like you didn't guess because it's a it's a navigational map uh, that was built for sailors. Yep. No, that's the reason why I, when I was talking about creating it today, I teased the fact that this is something that no one's ever seen before because it, it's not it's not going to be accessible until decide to reveal it as a yes but it's a it's a it's a, a bonus for those of you that are watching because you're the only ones that will ever see it you see. exactly the secret i can give it to you and then you can secretly say the real story of nikos right <laughs> Exactly. You, I give you a copy and get, save, save a copy for my son, right? Hello, whoever that is is hopping in and hopping out. I hear you. I, I don't see you. Who's who? Oh, okay. Yeah, he, he probably noticed that he said live and balked. Run away! Run away. Yeah. Well, as I said I would always do, by the way, you are on the live channel. We are live on Twitch right now. So, so you and me and all the secret tens of millions of people that actually view this that I don't know about are the only ones that know that this is the super secret map of South Southern Nikos. Yeah, well, that there, I, I, there almost always is. I think that I've got, I, 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 I know that I've got some fans that aren't, aren't uh, over. Yes. Uh huh. Right. Yes, I, I when I was a, when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Well, I know when I was uh well, yeah, we're so popular. I'm sure we have lots and lots of bots here, so. What's that? Uh Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, back back in the I got you. That's your funny guy. God. Uh Hey, exactly. That's not funny because I actually helped write that book. Um, I can't remember the, author, the the name of the book. It was the author's name was Mark Hutto, and it was a adventure book based on um, the the precept that Mars was a, a viable world where humanity lived, but it was overtaken by extraterrestrials who uh, wanted to steal the mantle, and so they. Created the pro the uh, location now we that we now know as Olympus Mons, the the mountain on Mars that's like twenty seven miles above the atmosphere or whatever, and then they built that as a platform to mine the uh, the uh, Martian uh, core. It was actually sucking the core out of Mars because Mars, given its size, should have a much more sizable. Um, there goes your speaker again. Should have a much, much, uh, yeah, it's better. You're good. What's that? Oh, they were, they were moving the liquid mantle. Yeah. Yeah. They were pumping it. They were actually pump, pumping it out. And as they, as they pumped it out, it was killing Mars and killing the local population. So the local population decided the only thing they could do was escape and leave for uh, Earth. Terra firma. Yeah. Pterodactyl. Ra ta ra ta ra. All right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There we go. There we go. So we have our three principal. Uh, what's the head in the middle? That is the pole. It's since it's uh, this is the southern hemisphere and nobody's been here, so it's considered to be deadly. It's dangerous to be down here, that kind of thing. So it's just a symbol. And I happen to instead of instead. Yeah, right, the right, smack dab in the center, exactly. Now, no, you'd be coming from the perimeter outside. So as you sail south out of, say, Tenerife, uh, you would, you know, from, from, from the, if you looked at the parallel map of, of Nikos, you'd be sailing in somewhere up here in this loop, up, up in this upper circle, more than likely finding. I, well, I've been planning to do this for, well, since I started Nikos. Nobody ever wanted to. I always thought there'd be that adventurous fool that would do the Leif Erikson and jump on board a ship and point it, uh, in the case of Earth, point it uh, west, and in this case, point it south, and just sail. And so, theoretically, wherever, you, wherever you're on, on Nikos, you could end up anywhere around the entire perimeter of this world. This is wherever you sail from. You'd be tracking not against the North Pole, but against this grid. So whichever of these hexes lines up with one of the six uh, points of power in the North, that will tell you where you're going to land up. So if you, say, left the, uh, the fifth one, counting uh, from the, the top uh, clockwise, you were going to come out of the fifth quadrant and somewhere along this outer edge here. Where you'd probably uh, arrive. No. But don't you feel special? <laughs> oh, the other, yeah, many people know about the different iterations. I mean, the other, the other uh, forms. No. There are, well, there are no other worlds in within the within the uh, ethos of Nikos. There's no uh, within the. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Canaveral was the closest they ever got. They built a three-stage rocket headed for uh, points unknown and hopefully try to find their way back home because they were going to go back and tell the Terrans about Nikos. And uh, then the players didn't know it, but inadvertently they launched an ICBM that took out the launch vehicle. So Canaveral never got a, never got a word off, so to speak, to Earth. So... Alrighty, so now we've got our bio, bio, uh, biosphere slash climb. So we have the Arctic, which is in the center. Then we've got our temperate, which is the like the brownish color, on color. And then yellow is the verdant jungle-like areas. So now, if you had some dice that have you, uh, or actually you could in the di in the in the this. Discord in one of the uh, text chats, roll a dice for us to determine where we're going to start. Assuming percentile roll from, from zero all the way around to 100, which would be coming back around. The, by a similar, be, well, actually, it'd probably be better just to roll it. Yeah, pull out your D36. <laughs> I don't know if, can it do that? I wonder. Can, can uh, Avray, the die roller, actually choose that? Hmm. I might go check that out. See. Oh, and by the way, uh, our uh, uh, young friend that joined us for a while yesterday, G, uh, G, GJ or whatever, he uh, contacted me today and asked for a clarification on the uh, season that we are in in Nikos because he went and did research on the rabbit, the leperine that he's playing, and found that they have different colorations by season. So he wanted to know which season it was so he would know what what color his rabbit is right now. And that's like cool. It means he's getting into it even as much as I do. So that's cool. Uh, yeah. Roll a deep. Yeah, what I, what I did is I, uh, number one is I 
have a 12 month a 10 month calendar and every day every month is 30 days long and the world ends when the second of the sun rises so when helios finally makes its appearance is when the um year changes so the last month it could be 36 days long it could be 34 days long it could be almost 60 days but the last month is odd odd mana all the rest of them are exactly 360 days and my work week is eight days because eight goes into 36 easier than seven and so therefore i also got to add in the concept of one of my favorite beatles songs which is eight days Then I named the days of the week differently as well, and so this is all lore that's buried. I don't, I don't use it because no one ever thinks about what day. You know, unless you have an appointment, most people don't think about what day of the week it is, right? So. Do, I, do we want any odd water features? Any particular? Do we want any geoma uh, geometric or odd uh, water features that could be, say, okay, that could work. That could work. I, I was what I, what I my original thought was to make. Well, no, no, no. In the center, well, it, no. It's actually the yellow areas are tropical. And the oh no! See, okay, we're, we're... yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yep, yep. See here. Oh, we want to go water, paintbrush, brush size, but I got to change. Now I got. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just trying to find something that that would be some, a symbol we could use for uh, that would uh, evince or elicit the idea that a uh, spiral is there. Because I don't know if I can. I don't think I have an icon that is a spiral or a whirlpool. I mean, you. Oh, there's definitely be an under. There's definitely an underwater city. Yeah, yeah, that that's the temperature. Yeah, that'd be the temperature change, temperature changing water. That's a good idea. How big can I make one of these? That's a question. No, that's not very big. Mm, well, use that for the center and see if I can come up with something else to expand it. I don't think the other circles were maybe. Would that be any, any different size? No, that's. That's a look like a storm ish thing. That too. Quite too dark. Let me try a different way. 
the thing about the thing about tools is you can reuse them. So. Ooh, I know how. I know how. We'll go back to land. We go to surface lifter. Brush size goes really small. We just lift mountain. I'm not gonna do so much. Now. All right, you have a great night. Can you come back? Sure, no worries. Yeah, if you got nothing else going on, feel free to hop in. You know I'll be here. Yep. Yeah, if we're not doing anything fun, people leave. What I'm trying to do here is make it exactly circular island. There we go. Let me go back to our symbol. Eraser. Get rid of the symbol. Now we've got mysterious island. Now I just take a circle. Back to symbols. Don't have this. Now, outer circle. Uh. Oh, that's maxed out, isn't it? Yeah, I can't make a bigger circle. Yikes. Mm -hmm. I'll think about that. Leave that for now. Alrighty, so let's instead it's uh we have one aquatic anomaly let's talk about one surface anomaly something that's going to be stand offish and strange geometric uh you know upon the surface i mean we look at earth in the, the, the telescope from space and we 
realize that they uh, they can see. Uh, well, the theory was could they always, could they ever see the Great Wall of China from space? And they determined that more than likely not. That it was even though it was a massively huge thing, unless you zoomed in close enough, you wouldn't be able to see it. The the alleged wall in South America that runs along the Peruvian coast is like 700 or 800 miles long and it's dot in the bucket and even the plains of Nazca unless you were down in the atmospheric you're not going to see it so if we're seeing this map you know at that scale that you're actually talking about the probably close to 10,000 mile coastline around this very intricate Design here, kind of hard to pick out where it might be, but I don't know. What do you guys think? Anything in particular? Give me a hint if you've got something you'd like to try. In the in the process, uh, again, from the standpoint of similar to the Piri Reis map, the idea is that this map is discovered and represents changes that are uh, the uh, southern continent that is going to be discovered during this iteration that's never been discovered not in 12,000 years of recorded history has anybody ever come down here so having that capability is kind of a, a heady proposition so if you've got an idea you'd like to include let me know I'm going to go back here to the land painter now most of the interior or the exterior yellowness is because of the location this also represents amounts of humidity and so i'm going to assume that some area along the coastline is going to be also likewise affected so i'm going to change my there we go and then i'm going to go along these areas and likewise give um, brighter or you know, richer colors because the humidity uh, would elicit some but not much on the interior as we get closer to the yeah, polar ice it shouldn't be nearly as strong much smaller areas That's an interesting idea. Have a nearly tropical jungle, jungle island this close to the polar cap. That'd be diversion. And see, it's, we're still in the nesting doll aspect. We're still working way up on the top line. We're not even worried about what species might live here, what kind of creatures might. We're just talking about what the climate would be like based on windage and stuff and so kind of similar between you know most coastal regions will be better off than areas that are interior because of the temperature diversion from uh the land warming process. Uh, there's a word. If you know what that is? Go ahead and put that in the chat. That have to be you know, cerebral about, or you know, if we're going to be be realistic about our fantasy, let's have a little bit of fan, uh, reality, uh, the fantasy in our reality too. Right? Anything down here? There is just oh, there's an interesting island there too. Interesting. 
Yes, right. Imagine it's be like the Pacific Northwest. There's verdant tree lines and such because the trees are able to draw in the, the water and therefore they're still fairly verdant even though they're maybe it's like the Yukon also. Lots of monstrously uh, hardy trees that can handle the cold right there next to the polar region. Alrighty. Alrighty. So next thing, I think we should do something kind of mystical with the division lines. Um, I'm familiar. If you're not familiar with, there's a great science fiction story called Hichi Rendezvous. And there's a whole Hechi series, H E C H E. And I can't even remember the author's name. And I'm just going to be too lazy to go look. If somebody in the chat wants to go and check it out, let me know. But the, this uh, concept of Hechi is that there are these, in fact, we find it's like a uh, uh, planetoid asteroid kind of structure that has device pods attached all over it, like mushrooms growing all over the outside of it. Each one of these mushroom-like pods is actually a, a trans-dimensional space device. And so if you sit inside it, you can activate it, and it will instantaneously travel to some unknown place in the universe and remain for some unknown amount of time. And then at the end of it, it, bring, it comes back. And so... The uh, mega corporations, because there's so much money that can be made by discovering some of these things being actual functional gateways, that they will pay you, you know, one billion dollars if you'll sit in this pod, go to its destination, stay as long as you can, and then come back. And then, if you can, and if you survive it, then you get ownership of the materials that come out of that specific world. So the idea here is that uh, each of these segments of the pie i'm imagining would have a different mystical effect because it, this is the part of the world that gets almost no light from nimbus but has its own interesting biome processes so having said that let's go to look at that symbols what was i the tool not regions it's got to be symbols this is overlay frame tool scale creator measuring tool no none of those hmm Water makes this. Hmm. I don't recall. Drive me crazy. Did it again. Hmm. That had to be symbols, was it? These mountains. No. No, it wasn't that. Oh, 
Oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is... Uh, I've been a game master for Dungeons & Dragons uh, and roleplay games in general for almost 50 years. And this is the southern hemisphere of a two-hemisphere system. I'll go ahead and show you the northern system because for the majority, well, all of the game time that I've been a game master, I've only needed the northern hemisphere. And when you see them, let me go ahead and save this one. Open. Uh, this is Nikos in the ninth iteration. And it's actually important that I open this map, so I thank you for that, so I can figure out how to do background imagery here. So this is the northern hemisphere as it's currently mapped in the orientation that the players have been most familiar with. The actual pole for Nikos is basically this mountain. In the center of the area known as this is historically known as cryopathia, cryopathia. and until this iteration was completely buried in ice and by magical means this time around they have um, liquefied the water and therefore ran off and therefore it's now a marshy muggy it's like a ray it's like a a raised water bed. In other words, the the water is still under the soil, but it's it's not visible, and there's not a uh, ice flow, and it's not cold because it's being held artificially. So by something in the story they haven't figured out. Yet. This is the northern hemisphere, and the reason why the water is called the black waters is although the color of the water in the ocean is u usually between a uh, a purple and a maroon and maybe even a red. The outer sea um, has never been navigated because there are no stars. For ten, th for eight thousand of the last ten thousand years, there's been no, there's been no stellar activity other than the solar body known as Nimbus, which is the sun for this world, and a secondary source, which is the binary star, uh, uh, the, the the actual star that this that the protostar Nimbus uh, uh, circles, which is called Helios. So, with that in mind, that this world's outer navigation has never been considered because no one wants to sail into the black water because if you sail out without stars, the chances of you ever coming home are almost non-existent because you cannot navigate uh, at all, and the tides, who knows what the tides do outside. So. This map that I'm now working on is actually a super secret project. Uh, you guys that are online are the only ones that have no, no, know about it yet. Uh, and therefore, because the, in the last 300 years, a stellar pattern has emerged that could be used for navigation, means that I need to start working on this possibility that they might one day go south. And furthermore, it's going to give my world a place to expand to as we develop our story even farther than it has. The play arc of the world is six and a half years long. So if you played every week to see all the pieces of the arc, you'd have to play six and a half years. Uh, six years, give or take. This, iter this last iteration took seven complete because they were actually finishing up some of the previous iteration which is a whole other story but um therefore i've got a there's a tool i just got to find it i don't know where the tool is i think it's under paths i think it could be under regions i don't no it's not regions although i could use them i could use it I'll use it. This color's going to be red. Why? Because of the...
Start here. Hold on here. Try that again. As your point, if it's through the arrow, I'll go all the way to the edge. All right, there's that one. Next is going to be orange. I don't know what the uh, ramification of this will be. Yeah, I don't know what we're actually delineating, but I'm going to divide them up in six. Next would be yellow. We have yellow. Color. Yellow. Oh, nope. Ah, Control-Z, such a powerful tool. Everywhere I can use it, I, I'm so happy. When I discovered that, I was like, uh, yesterday old. I mean, it was not something that I knew uh, through all the time I was designing before, but once I discovered it, it was like, oh, the world is a better place. Don't do that to me. There we go. Hey, welcome, welcome just to pose Manticore. Great name, by the way. I always love uh, li literary puzzles and, and plays on words and stuff, and that's very good. Get them. All right, like I said, I don't know what the colors are going to mean yet, but now we're going to green. And I like to use an off green. I don't like to use a standardized middle of the road green. So. There we go. And the reason why is that I don't know what these colors mean. I certainly don't expect it to be like how the governances are split, but I imagine it'll be something mid different region over region in magic terms. It feels right to me. Oops. 
Rosie again, my friend. Don't do that. Alrighty, next going to be a blue instead of red, orange, yellow, green. Yeah, blue, blue. Again, like the oddly varied version of the actual. And you'll notice that my map is off center, and that's partially on purpose and partially on accident. I could have set it up straight in the middle, but then the map wouldn't have felt uh, human. You know, we're not that perfect. But we'd like to think we are sometimes. Oh, there we go. It's going to work out. <coughs> and finally, Again, center point, outward. There we go. There we go. All right. So now, what to, what to decide to do with each of these? Uh, first slot is six. So are we talking six elements? I don't. I may have a, yeah. the movie. Oh wow, that's a mistake. Revise that. One. How do I revise? It's an interesting point. Do I want to do that with each one of them? Oh, they do. They do. They did. No, they didn't. No. Okay, let's back them. Back them all. I don't know what exactly I wanted anyway. Cozy. It's the map. They can make it go away. All right. Stop putting a dot on the map. All right. Hmm. All right, there you got my colors back. So we will go from outer edge to outer. point. Point. 
point. Now, you're right. Well, harder. eyeballing it instead of actually measuring it. That's okay. Sure. No. Hmm. Don't know if I can change that by not. No. Oh, there. There we go. There we go. That helped. But now I can get rid of it because again, every time I do these things, I learn something new about how to use the software. Text to post magic. I like that name. That was amazing. So, uh, yeah, so the reason to create this map is now that the sky is open and therefore stars can be seen, uh, the populace can start to calculate and predict where they are by astro -navig astral navigation. Um, on Earth, that happened during, I think, uh, the Viking era when they finally realized you could look at the stars and they were consistent enough that you could track your location by looking at them and then calculating the math finally was discovered or whatever. So, in like fashion, people never looked beyond the coastline because they knew you sailed out beyond the, 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 your ability to see the land, you never had a frame of reference to decide where the land was anymore. And so they simply didn't go. And for, I granted, if your story is dynamic and exciting and, and, and interesting enough that the players are going to be pursuing, pursuing the shiny ball, so to speak, they're not going to be looking for, oh, I do need to change that. Ah, uh, where's the that? Edit scene. That way, while we're, while we're looking at stuff, you can actually... I can see that you're seeing me, because uh, I sometimes forget that I can do this. It's like, yeah, I can definitely do that. There we go. 
All right, so now, now, uh, now when I'm talking, you can look at me and I can look at you. So this uh, map, therefore, we're, we're building is a super seeker project. No one's gone down here yet. Doesn't mean they won't someday, but. All right, so uh, back to what we were working on now that I, now that I know for sure how I can do it. Regions. Map location. Inner opacities at point two five. So the point. Order width we can go much lower, we can go down to five. Oh, go with no border or dash border or straight line or random line border. That's Interesting. Oh, no border. Yeah. Oh, didn't pick it. There we go. Ooh. Purple. Red. Control Z there. Uh, and again. There's red, now we go to yellow, uh, orange, orange.
Hasn't worked. Why is that at working? Right here and line up this one. Stop open the extra window. There we go. There we go. Now we go to the yellow. Stop opening windows. And now it's reversed it. Okay. Oh no, I did, I did both of them. No, uh, this is tedious, tedious work. That's okay. Orange. Why do you keep trying to open windows on me? So annoying. Uh, I say I'm getting not a satisfactory click when I'm clicking. I tell when I'm making connection. There we go. There we go. Back to yellow. Lello, as my little girl used to say. I miss her. Stop doing that. And finally. Not right. One more time. Would they get rid of the yellow? No yellows today. Green. Uh, 
Center point. Whoa. Yeah. Well, that time we got rid of one. Uh, I'm going to have to put the borders back on it. Just can't see what I'm doing. Yeah, that that worked out really. Good. Here we go again. That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. It's okay that it did that. I just need it to. I probably can't see the third one because they're in the way. Can I move them? I can. Oh, it's hot for a second there. There we go, better. What's in the room? Excellent.
Oh, no, that's an issue. Got her back. No, I got it. not right. That's not right. That's right. I think that'll work. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm making this arbitrary line and I'm fighting with it to try to make it accurate. That's just so silly. Next color, red. I feel so small compared to the others. Stop drawing for trade lines. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, uh, Brewing Chaos. I hadn't seen you. Welcome, welcome. And they've been a previous post. It's not realized. Okay. And it feels more not right yet. Next. Oh, no. That one red. There we go. Oh, don't do that. Stop doing that. Is 
Stop. So annoying. There we go, and then finally. There we go. There we go, finally. So, we don't know what the effect will be in each region, but their each region's got a different color code for mystical effects. Now let's get back to map building. Now, one of the reasons why I took all the time to get this part done is that we are operating at the highest level of the, of the Nissing doll. This is what people can see from the outside. So it gives me a reason to do uh, intricate things with the mountains and such. For example, going over to symbols, going over to mountains, and setting them at maximum size, what they look like. Okay, they're pretty sizable. And there are a series of different types of mountains and such, so the Different types elicit different things, and they're too big for them. Put them down. Oh, there. Five. Uh, Alrighty. So we have to decide with how we want to do the mountains. So I imagine in this one we're gonna have like a swirl pattern. Taller mountains in the center and the medium ones, the wings and then the tiniest ones down below. Like so that there. And since we've got a graduation of height based on snow caps and such. And they are sort of randomized. next.
and then we'll start with that one. I'll start in the next one. I'm going to move this around.
Schön, schön, schön. Anyway, if you're watching and you have any questions, feel free to ask because I'm not being very talkative tonight. Kind of deep in thought as I'm making this new app.
Artist to work. Aha. shift when creating points snap hold shift
Not worth it. Alright. So now we've got one, two, three, four, five. Alright. Next we go back to land and we go with symbols. The forest station. There we go. Jeez. Ah. Uh, oh. off. A big one. Like
It is. It's frozen. It's, that is bizarre. That is bizarre. Okay. Oh, region is
There we go. That, that works out good. Jeez. Oh. I can't possibly get it all done on it anyway, so I will have to learn how to make segmented maps so that I can work on each segment separately. In the meantime, let's go. Land, paint, dark.
You're back. Oh, I swear I was not looking at chat. When I'm using the software, I can't see the screen. So I have to just stop every once in a while and look over. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. You find a way. Well, it's not like we have a thousand people we're having to mod right now anyway, so. I think, counting yourself right now, I think we have one viewer. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I can. I don't even know how that works. So. I don't have anything. I don't know anything. Okay. Uh, I don't even know what that means. So I just have to activate stream elements, you said? Yeah. Well, we're going to be there someday, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got the, the, the some of the triggers set up so that at least I can see when somebody else is going to be in. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I actually, while he was, while uh, Juxtapose was here, I went ahead and pulled up my Danaco's map to show the other, the other uh, hemisphere. Okay, good. So I decided, if you look at the map, what I did this time around is I decided that this this hemisphere is much more greatly affected by magics, and that there was must have been some ancient power that imbued the six hexes, six segments of the continent with mystical energy and different weather effects. So, for example, one built took all the mountain structure and and using massive power moved all the mountains to one one line to create the wall so that, that one section just has a mountain wall but that means that uh to the leeward they get all the rain and so it's all marshy whereas the other side is all dry in a desert type environment sure sure yeah Yeah, just just showing the little little quotes that you're editing and stuff. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. That works. Kind of thing. I just don't like the F word. I mean, yeah, just be thrown out there. It's like, why? See, you can, you're, 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 you're an adult. You can actually use your actual words, <laughs> you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I see. Well, the Autobots, you can hit the ones that are automated sometimes. But then, uh... Yeah, nice. Nice. I was, remember, not, that was a show that was, my kids watched, I didn't watch. I've had a few. Three, I think. Well, I noticed that I, we had a bump in attendance when I had Sage Advice compared to uh, Dungeon Master ask, answers your questions. Yeah.
Do we have any topics that I want? Okay. Which one? Oh, this big one? Big one. Big blue one. Well, first of all, the blue lake is uh, it's a salt lake, like a dead sea. Notice the red, red water is normal water. So if water is blue, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> No, I, 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 I get that. I get that. Yeah, Mr. Gene, Gene would know that blue water's bad. Depends on which one it is. She's got at least two of them that should know. Yes. Most of the time. Most of the time. She has, she has her moments, her senior moments, where she, like, loses it. Well, no, I'm I'm call, I'm calling it senior because it's it's over when it when it when it happens. It's like Gene, Gene, where, where, what are you doing? Because there are certain things that certain characters are very keen on. Like Gene doesn't like the uh, Rainbow Veil. He really hates the fact that there is an. Uh, uh, faith community that are worshippers of the actual broadcaster, not his message, and so they have they have uh, statues of him and things like that. And she gets really angry. And she's the kind of person that, as a high priestess, would literally go into the place and tear the ta tear the statue down, that kind of thing. And sometimes her other characters forget who's who, and she thinks she's that person and goes and tries to overthrow the religion with her other characters. It's like, Jean, Jean, this isn't, this isn't Mary. She can't be doing this. Oh, nice. Another guy insulted our picture of the uh, cover of Dark Shards. He just wrote, he's, he goes, this is cool. Anything Barbie is hot right now. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's horrible. Horrible. There's a, a scene where um, Ken is talking to all the other Kens on the beach, because of course in Barbie land, all men are named Ken. So the one Ken says to the other Ken, he says, I, you know what? You're, you're pissing me off. I'm going to beat you off right now. And they're on the beach. He goes, well, you can't beat me off before I can beat you off. And the other one says, well, I can beat you both together. <laughs> beat you off together. Yeah, it's all very sexual. It's like, really? Really? That's... that's. Oh, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's horrible. And there's a, a, a bad Barbie that, that's been abused. And, they, and and she's like got crayon marks on her face and one, one eye is missing and the other one's got too long of an eyelashes and yeah it's it's what a child would do to a Barbie doll you know it's like if that's what happens to Barbie yeah yeah and and the like the high points of the movie are when Barbie stops walking on her tiptoes remember the dark Barbie dolls are always made to wear high heels so 
if <laughs> they Peter Arch. Yeah, so it shows her. Oh, I, I watch a lot of review stuff. I like uh, people that... Like, I like Critical Drinker. If you've never seen him, he's hysterical. Critical Drinker is a Scotsman that goes to the theater uh, completely blasted and then writes his review while he's drunk. And, and, and he's actually pretty good. He's actually pretty good. But the only time that I've ever seen him completely break his stride is um, when all the racial tension was going berserk and he decided to review Wakanda forever. It was pretty obvious he didn't want to get in any trouble. So his, his normal, his normal sign-off at the end of his show is, that, that's all I've got for now. Now go away. And, you know, go away. You can go away now. But in that one... Because he knew he was probably going to be seen by a, a bunch of people from another audience. He didn't. He didn't insult anybody and everything. So it was like, oh, yeah, you're playing the politically safe game there. Nice. So I haven't put any civilization markers or anything. I've just put the geographics. What kind of a climb did I not include? I've got deserts, marsh. No, we're not going to be, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be naming it. The players always get the name shit, you know. Yep, yep, or, or whatever name I come up with at the moment. I don't, I don't intentionally ever have a name for something. Well, as soon as they do, then I start naming crap, and then I drive them crazy, because then we'll spend three hours. Hey, you want to keep doing this? I'll keep naming shit. <laughs> and when I do, I'm taking notes and marking the maps and stuff. Oh, I, I I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do with that southern part of the mountains. So if you notice, each of the each of the terrain features the mountains were used in some particular function or fashion. Well, the uh, four square, the uh, sixteen. Uh, I'm thinking to my head called the sixteen soldiers until the players name them. Uh, need some kind of t modification to the train on the outer half of the. The Swamp and Bog is uh, the uh, purple, or the blue hex up here. Got uh, bogs and swamps, that's what that all is. Where the green runs along the rivers. And the... Hey, dude, we could definitely have more forest. I, I made the in interior of it just chock full of trees. Maybe it's an maybe it's an ant place and maybe the sixteen soldiers are meant to uh, to stop a war between the northern ants and the southern ants or something. Well it, 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 this may end up being your, your, your hexes right here. This might be your section of Nikos. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know how we do it. Um, that's why I, that's why I 
Oh, uh, that's. But there's a there's a word for it. It's a new Newton new, uh, Newtonian uh, Newtonian solid. Yeah. Yeah, there's a book series based on that. Yeah, I've got uh, you know, oh, a flight floating island. Yeah, Nikes already has one of those as a, as a city on it. And North, Northern Nikos has that already. They can definitely have things like that down here, too. Got a nice. Oh, yeah, what's that? What? Wait, wait. wait. Land, raised land, brush size very tiny. Well, I'm talking about the ones that die that fall back down. Because all you're going to see are the ones that fall down, right? No, I'm no, I'm talking. I'm talking about on a on a map scale. You're not going to see the floating ones because they're going to be moving around all the time. But if, like, if you, you see what I'm doing here, is I'm dotting this waterway down here with actual islands, little microscopic islands. And the more times I hit the, when they hit multiple sizes, then they start to get a little bit bigger. But to show like this would be absolutely unnavigable by a boat because the water is right it's, that's that's what that's what i'm doing here is that the land that the, this this portion here which the, with the triangle symbol is supposed to be in, uh, indicative of change and so this area was still trying to grow this the, the continent was actually trying to still grow and it broke up into little pieces like you're talking about. And so there are the floating islands that feel a little bit like, uh, oh, what's uh, Avatar, movie Avatar, Pandora. So it's like Pandora with the with the little islands growing and roots and trees off of each other and all of that as they're trying to expand and grow, but they've broken off from each other and they can't, they can't, it's not sustainable. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, we got a. We just got a. We, we got a question. We got a question from Brewing. Chaos D and D. He wrote, "Good morning. Tonight I have a D and D session. The players were invited to a fancy dinner at a mansion. I will likely have to deal with more than twenty NPCs at the same time. They're taking their loved ones, so that's so that they are important NPCs. Any advice how to manage so many NPCs? Yes." First thing you do is divide them into families. If the players are not related to each other, maybe they find out at this event that they're long lost cousins. That means that your NPCs can follow along family lines, and therefore you don't have to come up with an entire group ideology. I mean, you don't have to come up with 20 unique NPCs. You 
Well, also, he's saying that 20 of them are special or important. If they are important, if they are important, it's a matter of whether they're important right now or if they're going to be important later. So if they're going to be important later, you want to make them memorable, but you don't have to make them deep. If, on the other hand, they're going to be important right away, the players are going to start asking questions, and then you got to go deep, right? So... Yes, but the issue is, uh, if you haven't tried to run 20 NPCs in a session, most people can't do 20 different voices, personalities. Reasonably, reasonably, they can, you know, they will think about, what I always say is think of cartoon characters. Because char cartoon characters are always over the top verbally, you know. Uh, Sylvester, uh, Sylvester the cat, with his with horrible lisp, an example and uh elmer fudd his inability to say ours yeah the, uh that's porky pig porky pig has a stutter but we you you i i really kind of downplay using uh, uh voice limitations like that like not being able to say your ours or lisping or whatever even though they're funny they also can be demeaning if somebody in the room has a problem with stuttering or having a speech thing. So I, I'm kind of, uh, it's, it's interesting. You have to kind of figure out how you're going to do it so that you're not. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah well, we, we, have, we Americans, we, have, we Americans have given the world a, a, a plethora of dialects that you can burn burn through like you could do it you could do a drawl it's you know <laughs> well even where you breathe like peter lorry or uh, darth, darth vader you know that whole big deep every once in a while mm-hmm But yeah, so my thought, my thought would be, if you have a party of five or six adventurers, then you should have five or six of these guys pretty deeply divine in case the players decide to grind into them. And you can always have, hey, thank you. Right, and therefore, if somebody does want to go deep, the younger relatives or whatever will defer and say, oh, you need to talk to Charlie. He knows a lot more than I do. That way, you only have to keep your repository of information with Charlie. So you don't have to, A, have everybody in the, in the family know. You just have the one guy who does available for them. That's a good, that's a good choice. Um, also, having the uh, NPC grouping have an agenda you know they, they they it's like think like uh uh what was this show on hbo i don't know oh, wheel wheel no no yeah, that was no i was gonna say wheel of time but it's not it's the george martin game of thrones again game of thrones in the game of thrones you know, you get to know the family Lannister and the family uh, Stark or whatever, and those families would have agendas. And so when they come to the party, they would be there to do that one thing. Like, oh, we're here to get our niece married off, or we're trying to find a find an appropriate person to carry out this curse or whatever. So... Yeah. You, well, you, you could have the one... One uh, black sheep family that's there just to grab as much silverware as possible, you know. <laughs> let the party make right. Let, 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 let the party make insight checks all night as they're lifting table table napkins and the and the uh, the charger from the from the big table and the 
silver skewers in the meat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's it's really for, if you're dealing with a large group and you've helped set it up, then you need to have an idea of what you want each other groups to be doing, and then kind of follow through with that. I hope that I hope that helped a little. PCC. Yeah, could could Or one's one's from the old land, old country, and there doesn't only speaks a, another language, so he just kind of mumbles at you. Yeah, they, yeah, but that, 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 that those those all work. Um, yes, and as far as and, and 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 I know it sounds crazy, but the best way to handle it is draw yourself a a seating chart. So they, so the players have to choose where they sit, talk to whom, so you can keep them from overhearing conversations that are going on across the room. So, because realistically, when you're at a big dinner party where there's twenty some people, you can't possibly eavesdrop on all of them. So you have to pick where. Right, right, and then if they spread themselves out, then they can't talk to each other as well, and so there's not as much. So there's not as much player collusion and and. Uh, Cross manipulation within the scene. Yeah. Yeah, and well, that means that you can also say, of course, you can always walk around. You know, these dinner affairs are multi. There's there, there's several different uh, horses, and so you want to get up and move around and change seats or whatever. We can, we can do that during the game. Exactly, exactly. Now that's, there you go. There's a madman way to do it. Just randomly roll dice, say, uh, clean cups, clean cups. Exactly. Well, well it might, or what's uh, the old uh, Henny Youngman, mind if I table hop and then have somebody just show up at their table. And and have two or three of them that are lively and loud because the lively and loud ones are going to make a scene out of themselves. And that can be red herrings or it could be the important story bit. And then it's be up to you as the, Game master to present it so that the players have to choose whether or not, you know, Uncle Charlie just told us that that Aunt, Aunt May has a secret item in her house that keeps her young. Do you want to pursue that, or you think he's making that crap up? Yeah, like some somebody might be poisoned. So, so somebody, somebody's poisoning the cows. Not that we're going to drag that back into here. <laughs> the, the South 40 is just sucks. <laughs> Charlie, what are you going to do about it? We know you're the landholder. <laughs> All great ideas. Good stuff. So, uh, BCC already used your point system. Yay! Night, a, he a hex. Hey, I don't care. Set it up right now. Oh, let me see if I can. Just a second. I haven't been on. That would be under, for my side, it's under Stream Manager. Yeah, he has. Well, after after we gave the answers, when he pumped in the thousand.
Okay, so that these are this is under the the point system. Where is that at under from a manager standpoint? Is that, not, is that goals? No, it's not goals. Oh, okay, that's that's fine. That's fine. We'll figure it out. Community roles, activities, by activities. Now that's just saying what we're doing. <laughs> Not streaming tools. Extensions. Pick manager. Yeah, hundred thousand is fine. Yeah, well, I, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure how many. What, 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 is, that, is that a dollar equivalent or something? Hey, oh, uh, Zanderfell, Zander, am I reading that right? Zanderfell eighty four. Nice to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, uh, Xanderfell? No, I think Xanderfell sounds like a, a, a great and powerful wizard. I am the amazing Xanderfell. Notice at no times do my fingers leave my hands. Fewer rewards. There we go. Okay, Ch yeah, but it's channel points, right? Okay, I'll look into it there. Welcome, welcome, Thunderfelt. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm uh, building a map of a super secret new continent for the world of Nikos. I've been game mastering for almost almost 50 years, 47 years. And I am, uh, sorry for being quiet, I'm actually trying to type in something at the same time. It's like your brain goes into one mode or the other. And hope both thoughts are here at the same time. later all right all right there you go Thunder what was a samurai excellent second edition that rocks second edition I've, I've been I've played them all second edition is very close to being my favorite I like 5e only because it's a conveniently useful tool yeah I, I myself have developed uh, my own RPG, so I actually run under a, under a system that's not widely known known as Nikos RPG. But uh, in eighty three, eighty four is the year you were born. My son was born in eighty one, and my daughter was born in eighty five. So, right about the same age as my kids. 
Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I think that a lot of people use their character names uh, for their uh, their first character names for handles, but uh, I couldn't really do that because I was when I was so new, I was I I imitative, not innovative, and so I actually role played as uh, Bilbo Baggins. I'm, I'm not. I'm not uh, ashamed of it, but it's it's like yeah, you, you got to give me a break. I was eleven. So. <laughs> So what you'll notice about this map that I'm working on is that it's it doesn't have a compass rose, but instead what it has is the uh, the skull in the middle, the white skull indicating the actual pole, and that the polar region has been split into six segments, which are color coordinated, uh, rainbow fashion in a circle, starting from the uh, well, if you look at it this way, it goes from uh, Purple to blue to red, orange, yellow, green, uh, back to blue. So, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, in a circle. And each segment has been manifested in some way magically and has affected the mountain ranges and the terrain types. So, one hex is particularly lowlands and has lots of marsh. One of particularly highlands and has almost no water. It's a desert hex. Uh, another has mountains in a circle, suggesting that the land itself seems to be ripping itself apart. And another is verdant, absolute chaotic growth. Another one is very organized, but bi uh, bifurcated and divided. And then finally, the last one is just kind of all over the board with the the triangle shape indicating the term change. So, uh, anything you would like to know is that a fall in particular, feel free to ask. Uh, if you have uh, any comments or inputs about what you think I should do with the map, feel free to do that. Here we go. Right. Right, right. Well, see, my my system's been coming. The idea of a of a change what wasn't for me a change in role play. I mean, a change in the mechanics of of, of a game that existed. In other words, I wasn't making a derivative. What I actually did is created an alternative, and that is a system that is uh, has no armor class, has no. Uh, hit points has no uh, character classes, has no level advancement. Instead, it has constant player improvement. The players just improve week over week over week by their own actions in game, and therefore they control their level their level ups and advancements. The game master doesn't even have to bother with that, which means that the storyteller doesn't even have to worry about things like adventure leveling and equalization of CR ratings and all of those burdensome pieces and you can just stay on the aspect of role play. If you want to know more feel free to ask me and you can also watch all the videos I've done that are on YouTube. There's an entire channel on how to play Nyko. I'd be glad to answer any questions you want and uh, when you say you create your own are you a world builder like this where you create the the fact that the, the, the the fictional existence and, and the wonder of how it got there, or are you talking about just the pure uh, mechanical differences between the way you progress or whatever? But uh, hear more about what you're doing as far as that's concerned. Some things about the map you may not realize. The water is red because the planetary light coming to the planet is uh, deeper in the uh, red end of the color spectrum, and therefore the um, water photosynthesis, photosynthesis works in different ways. As a matter of fact, green is usually considered to be a color of sickness on that ghost. 
And so, like, for example, these rivers where there are green spaces aren't necessarily positive growth places, but rather uh, bugs and insects and, and uh, de 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 decay, that kind of thing. <sighs> hills. The hills are alive. Wait a minute. I got you. Gotcha. Amazing. If you if you if you're going with nine, have you seen the tristat system? Uh, that one's a, a pretty unique idea. It's three groups of three, so it's physical, mental, emotional, but then each of those represents three. So dex, uh, dexterity, strength, constitution, other physical, that kind of thing. So you end up with nine, but you're only having to worry about announcing or dealing with three of them most of the time. It's considered a tri-set system. If you get a chance to look at that. That's out of a uh, company in, China, in uh, Canada. Oh, those are too silly looking. Okay, well, I would, I would recommend if you get a chance, take a look at, at the uh, Nikos RPG. Uh, there's a, a instant play and a quick start sheet available for free at uh, nikosrpg.com. And that kind of gives you an outline of the way the Nikos RPG mechanism works. I think you might find it might be the kind of helpful for what you're looking for in terms of what, I've, what I mechanically did is I took the concept of the saving throw that every game uses and made that a, a default condition. Everybody gets a, gets their, gets a chance to improve those at the very beginning, and then after that's set, then you build out all your skills from that. And the difference between the mechanisms is the skills constantly are improving, and they basically cover every possible kind of success. But more importantly, once you understand that, then you can also understand uh, QDR, quality, quality, uh, quantum die, die reading, and that's the idea of looking at your dice rolling completely differently, and in doing so, you're able to get to a conflict resolution much faster, 
much more cinematically and, and arguably a lot more fun. So if you can, if you want to take a look at that, that's uh, free at nikosrpg.com and just hit the, go to the uh, character sheet page and then you'll be able to not only download the character sheet in a, in a variety of ways, but you can also grab the uh, easy play, quick play rules. Yeah, it's amazing. Every game master on the planet, if they're if they're worth their salt and they're already aware of their their conditions, every game master is actually a, a game designer because we all play, we all want to play differently. We have our own ideas. We want.
Big dead trees. That's okay. Yeah, the, to me, it, uh, the, 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 the mindset about role play has changed, and the mechanic to the game has become sophisticated to the point where it's nuanced, but it can be really t too much. And so with, with the, the approach that I've taken to developing, it's been to down... Uh, to uh, shift backwards, if you will, to um, simplify and to uh, put more power in the creativity of the, the mind, the, the, the storytelling aspect, the theater of the mind, so to speak. So I, I get, I get the, re the appeal of additional um, variation in themes having more numbers versus less numbers and all that. It's all, it's all how every storyteller tells their story, right? And Lifter. Epic. There we go. Great minds think alike. We all come to similar conclusions in the end because we all want the same thing, but we don't all know how to ask for it or how to accomplish it. Ads, they're so much fun, right? Cool. Well, welcome back. So, just to show you a quick comparison, the Nyko's mechanism only has uh, six foundation numbers that are called the base: brilliance, cognizance, grace, presence, resilience, resolve, and foundation. Uh, 
I need to fix my video. Give me a second here. Gotta change out my camera. That's the wrong one. There we go. So the brilliance. Uh, let me get the piece of paper out of the way. Uh, brilliance, car, grace, presence, resilience, resolve, and foundation are fundamentally the saving throws in the game. They're going to be the one number that is when everything else goes wrong, you'll be able to fall back to. And each one of them covers a different part of the personality of the, of the persona you're playing. So your brilliance is your intelligence, wisdom, smarts. Your cognizance is your awareness, alertness, uh, observation. Your grace is your dexterity, your agility, your prowess. Um, your presence is the... Um, personality power it's something that doesn't dnd doesn't have a very good example of the closest you might get to is a charisma but presence is more about how you present yourself in a crowd uh resilience is your uh constitution resilience is your uh with with able to withstand poisons uh bad conditions etc resolve is your mental de determination with these, with these attributes, with these numbers, these base foundation known numbers, you're able to determine a general value for your persona in any given situation, defaulting to these in places where skills don't apply. But in normal re relationships, skills always uh, overcome them. In other words, you would use a brilliance value uh, in the case of intellect, but if you pick up and learn, uh, say, magic, as a, you, know, you pick up a skill in Magic 101 or whatever, now you've got the ability to advance that skill in magic all the time. It was originally based on brilliance, but it's actually enhanced with the experience over time by your, your improvement of it to where it can be become perfected, if you will. And that magic use can therefore also be a spawn for new specific skills. Like beyond having magic, there might be a skill in detecting magic or averting or turning magic, countering magic. And these are all things that you as a player choose to specialize in. So the advancement is always under your control. And with, with a base set of numbers, then the number of potential skills become infinite because I, it doesn't matter. You can have a skill, whatever skill you want. You as a player will discuss with the, with the storyteller game master what skill is you want to improve and then he'll give you a yes or no and then go. Um, the mechanism is presented as Hello, Blue Steel Dame. I'm going to say Steel Dame Sakura. Nice to, nice to see you. Steel, Steel Dame Sakura. Cool name. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are there's seven. I'm glad you asked about the seventh one. You see, the rest are there for specifics, but sometimes a individual skill doesn't really apply. Like, for example, the case of swimming. Swimming is sort of a grace skill, but it's also a strength skill. It's sort of uh, part of your mental awareness. It's also part of your cognizance. So when those kinds of situations happen, you go to the foundation. And the foundation is the average of the other six. So if, even if you have an overall moderately you know, okay set of numbers, but you have one extremely good number, the, that extremely good number will increase your foundation so it'll cover your general overall uh, numerical values better. So uh, the way these manifest, therefore, is you develop them. They're all going to be a percentilized system. So for argumentation... I'm just going to put in numerical values that just are middle of the road, and I'll explain why they're middle of the road here in a second. It's a percentile based system, and I'm, I'm just putting numbers in arbitrarily. We'll talk about how you get to them in, in character product, uh, creation later, but. And I'm pulling the, these numbers completely out of my hat. Uh, the numbers when you roll are going to happen someplace normally between 25 and uh, 40, uh, most of them. But they can vary considerably, so I'm just going to put in some numbers, just so we have them to play with. Oops. 
Now, the difference between these numbers and traditional uh, RPG numbers is that these are uh, fundamentally your defaults. They don't change. They don't change again. Once you built them, this is your skeleton, so to speak. Those numbers will define who you are in game. So. Uh, So 35, 25, 55, 20, 30, 35. If we add those all together, that's a, what, 60, 115, 135, 160, uh, 165, 185, 190, 190 divided by 6. Let me get my calculator because I don't have that memorized. Right. And it comes out to 30, 31.6 when we round up, 32. So now when we make checks, we check, make checks against that specific number. Welcome back. Howdy, howdy. They had a question with um, Zonderfuls, who's been here since you, you took off. He, uh, Pop back in and was given an explanation of his his combat his role playing system. And so I was just giving him a comparison. So uh, his his is uh, got nine different skills, and uh, he's I'm trying to balance them. Thought about using a dance. Right, 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 right. Gotcha. Yes, that's a very good, very good choice. Zenithal talks about beauty and ugly being relative, and so therefore using a. Right, you can have a rel relative, relative beauty. Yes, but even that's cultural, right? Because uh, you look at look at look at artwork. Uh, some people, uh, what's the old uh, Queen song? Fat bottom girls. Some people really get into that, and some people, that's like, mm, I don't want to. Yeah, I, I've seen Twilight Zone. I've seen all of them. Right. Uh, right, exactly. 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 So. Yeah, you can't. You can use it. Use an appearance value, but I I usually I use that. I use the term for presence for that because even if you're, uh, even if you're not an attractive person, you can still convince people to do stuff. You know? And okay, he's also pointed out his his setting is post-apocalyptic, and so yeah, your your ugly can be really ugly if it's you know mutated and your ears on the side you is on the front of your face and stuff on the side. Yeah. Oh, downshift is the Nikos parallel. I do run, run, run post-apocalyptic all the time. So. Oh, I haven't. Xanderful, if you're, if you're interested, we are trying to put together a group on Saturdays that would be uh, run uh, theoretically in, in Twitch, so it would be video, but uh, we have an audio function, so if you could, if you wanted to be involved, you could play. We're trying to put the game together for Saturday mornings at uh, 10 p.m. at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, California. So if you're interested, any of you, it's like we had we had a couple of people watching earlier, so I don't know how many have now. But... Yeah, 209. Yeah, and they all want to play. Cool. That's I want a challenge as a game master. Bring me, bring me. Oh, I have ways. I I I, I used to run large game books. games. Oh, you you pl you play in teams, so the teams have stuff to talk about between themselves all the time. No, they 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 well, well some people can, like get on a team just so they want to belong and they don't want to do action they just want to be part 
I, I, I embrace that. There are some people that want to get on and be active on a physical way. So we've got a, a, a um, portion of the game that is miniatures based or, or map based. So they're actually doing advancing on the maps or whatever. And then you have some that just want to do the politics. And so you have the political wing. And then in between, you've got the people that are carrying the information back and forth between them. You know that are that are providing constant influx from. I, I'm on. You know the guy can say I'm. I've been watching the uh, the tabletop game, and I noticed that our our minis guys aren't aren't putting our forward uh, units uh, into combat. They're backing them off or whatever, and so they can talk about strategy and stuff. So that's how it works. Is you're playing as a larger group, so that the individual players are doing something all the time because they're doing what the part the part of that part that pol that process that they want to be a part of. Ah, uh, he says he can't. He, he doesn't think he can help us. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, we we. Yeah, we're 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 more than we're more than willing to work through it. And if there's something comes up, one one thing to notice about the if we're utilizing the Nikos RPG system is that your character, even when you're not there. Because you're actually enjoined him and, and, and that you're the character that you create is not actually created, he actually already lives on Nikos. He's there whether you're able to be there or not, so the other players can shepherd and, and guide or whatever. So you're part of the community anyway. So even if you have to bail out or, or depart from the table for a moment or even, you know, for an extended period, it wouldn't prevent you from being a part of the story if you wanted. So don't feel restricted or limited in any way that far, as far as that's concerned. Your microphone went again. Your microphone went again. Yeah, just when I think you exploded again. Oh, well, we don't want you to be. We have, if it's something that, no, I just now reread his message. What he says is his medical issues, if they are triggered, can and will disable him. I, I don't really want to disable anybody <laughs> so if it's like if he t wrenches his head he's going to lose use of his legs or something we don't want that <laughs> we do not want to be responsible for that his last Xanderful's final comment there was sadly I don't think I can I have missed playing but my medical condition if they do trigger cannon will disable I don't want any permanent disabling If it just prevents you for the moment or for the session or whatever, that's fine. Then, then we can we can work around that. Right. And it's not like we're requiring cameras and all that kind of stuff because I'm the only one foolish enough to put my face out here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've got Jean, who's involved with Nikos so far. It's cost her an arm and a leg. Well, at least a leg. I'm kidding. Uh, Jean's uh, uh, lost her leg below the knee for, from di diabetic foot problem. And Scott is paraplegic. Got multiple sclerosis and plays from a wheelchair. Does it matter to me? Whatever, whatever you want to do, whatever you can do. If you can't play cool, you're more than welcome. And we will be there. We will be here on Nikos RPG at Saturday, or I will be here at least Saturday morning. Yep, we will definitely. Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll be sitting online, you know, sucking on my thumb if I'm by myself. But. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh dear. Commodities. Uh, things that we take for granted? Hmm. Well, see, coffee. Um, 
any 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 um uh Well, since Nikos is a completely different world, uh, the use of any words that we use in English for the food stuffs that are there are analogs so that our human brains can comprehend what we're doing in a fictional world. So, Nikosian apples are not apples, for example. They, they, they come off of trees, but they're, they don't even look the same. But when I say you're going to go shopping for apples, it's because I know what you mean when you say apple in English. And it goes back to what you and uh, you and G were talking about the other day with the whole uh, trading and whether or not when I envision an apple, am I saying is it, that it's a red ripe or is it a PG or is it a whatever? Uh, right, but nonetheless, we'll all be able to acknowledge at that moment that that definitely was an apple. So. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, he's uh, he's a player. He says he says that he's been dealing with GERD, uh, gas gas problems, uh, gastritis, and throat, and it messes up and. When it goes bad, he can feel his pain and goes to the point where he can't even light a cigarette. He steps away. Oh, yeah. Yep, no worries. Yeah. He, you'll find that we roll with punches really well, so no big deal. You're, you're welcome in any way. If you can make it, it'd be awesome. If you can't, we, we understand. But, uh, yeah, no, the, you're right. As far as the description. See, I believe that the biggest danger in role-play games is that the players won't create the imaginative pieces in their mind. And they'll expect the storyteller to give it all to them. And that's that's a problem. In other words... Right, because we're on live stream, yeah, and you gotta have a, you're having an episode, yeah, yeah, we could we definitely recommend that. But um, yeah, so I just, I just know that a player, um, if he's asking the game master for details, it's important to give him the details. But the game master also needs to know what's important to a player, and if the NPC, or I mean, if the player is always asking I don't know, details about every little thing, you know, <laughs> it's like, where, where do you draw the line? If I said, okay, there's uh, two, for, uh, two different kinds of forks and a knife on the table, your reaction would be, what do you... Right. Right, right, right. His backstories are 5,000 words long. Ooh, we have so much to talk about. <laughs> well, first of, first of all, my, 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 my background as a game master, it goes back to when that wasn't a thing because the adventure was what your character did in-game. So your adventure, your session zero would be the, the, the furthest extent of your actual backstory. You would find out the things that you don't know or that you do know, and then go forward from that, pursuing the things you wanted to, or leaving behind the things you wanted to, wanted to ignore. Oh, he can hear the. Well, so it, it, if if we're going to if you know if we're talking about a brand new game and we're just going to sit down and roll characters, there's no need for backstory whatsoever because we will discover. I'm just saying. Yeah, if the player well, so if a player has written one, like in this case a five thousand word document, and they want me to read it, I will agree that I will in, incorporate what I can of it and what I can't of it. We will adjust, and when we adjust it, it may mean elimination or. Backburnering parts of it, 
because either they don't fit or are not possible. Uh, a good example is I had a player who wanted to play a person who had been mutilated as a child because they wanted to have a character who had this built-in drama. And it's like, you can bring the drama, but I'm not going to allow the character to be mutilated. I'm not going to put on an onus on somebody in my world that did a really horrible, horrible thing because I don't even want to think about the horrible, horrible thing. But if you want the drama, bring it with you. Just leave the explanation on the, on the table. You know what I'm saying? Yes, your character had a very bad experience. That's as far as it needs to go, as far as I'm concerned. Because, the, like you said, you and an apple and me and an apple, if I say you were abused as a child, and you, I mean, you tell me you were abused as a child, I'm perfectly fine with putting a gate up and saying, okay, there is an abuse behind there. I do not want to know what it is. I personally do not want to bring that forward and try to pursue that in game. Yep. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Exactly. But but I'm just saying, if they want to carry a specific trauma, because it's what they want to have experienced in their backstory, I'm okay with it. Just don't expect that to be carried out in the role play. Yeah. Well, I, th I, th I, th I think it's kind of important to note that uh, what he brings up is he says that he doesn't, many people don't take the back background seriously, but he does because he uses the motivation for play to play the character. I think the injunction kind of explains why that's, that's so different. You as a player can bring any drama you want because when you jump into the persona, you're bringing that personality with you. That personality is who you chose to play. The person, the actual persona, the body of the being that you're coming into did not have those experiences. So there isn't a need for a really deep background for the persona because you don't know that persona. You're literally jumping into the into that life at the point of creation. So you want to bring the drama, that's what you bring with you. It's not what the persona had with them. You see what I'm saying? So the character didn't have to go through those horrible things you as a player chose to include in your story. Does that make sense? Am I talking out of my hat straight? Right, but I, my, my, I guess what I'm referring to is that the process of doing so is a, a process where the player is putting on a, an NPC a history. And I'm just trying to explain that, that it, in, my, in my way of thinking about role play, the... We haven't, we just started. We literally were going over his RP system and then we asked him about playing. So, no, I haven't gone, gone over the entire... Yeah, thank you for, for telling him. No, we have, we, like I said, we were just going over his, his mechanics and, and doing a comparison to what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Your microphone's going again. You started getting the, you were getting the feedback again like we did. Yep, you're good now. <clears throat> you were uh, trying to explain that, that Nikos is skills-based and that the skill advancement is what the players choose to do and that it's based on that, not on character class because the limitations of class are, are eliminated. So instead you choose the direction you want to go. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. He says, including slavery and all kinds of horrible stuff. It's like, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm glad you say you asked the game master because uh, slavery is not a thing. You know that, that that it may have happened in the in the, in the global past, but not a, not a, that the characters would have to be involved with. Not, 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 okay, not per se. So, in other words, there can be imprisonment, or uh, when when gov when government takes over another government, or whatever, a forced migration and that kind of thing. But as far as uh, the outright ownership of people, no, not at all. Uh, there are people who uh, willingly will indenture themselves for different reasons. Either they're like uh, when a land landholder decides he's going to. Uh, lend lease he'll, his land. He'll uh, indenture people to uh, guarantee that the work gets done. But in trade, then they get to own part of it when they're done. That kind of thing. We have, we have we definitely have we definitely have priestly orders. Um, they are dedicated to principles of philosophy, not of religion. So, uh, for example, the uh, control discipline is all about uh, kind of thing. Think of the uh, standard mon uh, monastery where you know very stringent. Wake up at wake up at dawn. Go stand on the hot coals for two hours and uh, then you know. Uh, kneel down and, and pray in the sun for so many hours or whatever as pure discipline so it's control but it's not uh, worshipping a specific being mm -hmm. no I get that I, I, he, said, he says the details of the world is more important to me than other things um Otherwise, without that information, it would force you to guess, which makes it harder to uh, match your character to the world. That's true. That's why I do include the information in the uh, um, Dark Shards book that, in, that covers the various pantheons of faith. And I use pantheon more for a word, uh, word to, to define the mechanism of magic. So it's not a religious pantheon. It's not a, a series of gods that you must worship. Instead, it's a a collection of magics that use a similar structure. So there are uh, the Orders of Falan is one of the pantheons, and the Orders of Falan are the five elements: air, fire, earth, water, and magic. And so Falan worshippers do their magical stuff all using similar uh, mechanics, ethos, and therefore they are put together as a pantheon. So. Yes, you would have to know exactly. Uh, he's probably bothered you know, again of the concept of Game of Thrones. You'd have to know whether or not you know, what what the uh, Baratheons and the Lannisters and and all the different groups are doing. And that's all really what comes down to a session zero. Normally, is that the game master has to explain where you are, what what the setting is, what what those parameters are, and from that, therefore, I can see building a building a backstory from that point, but not necessarily building the backstory first and then trying to shoehorned it in. Oh, he's got ads. Oh, probably because we've had higher view account, so therefore it thinks it's going to make more money off of this. Ha ha ha. Shouldn't be any more than normal, though, because I don't, I, I don't have any parameters set. Are you back, Zen? Oh, that's true. Some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, welcome back, Zen. So um, we didn't. I, I, I noticed when you said ads, so there wasn't there wasn't any content there. But yeah, the idea of doing a session zero or a first session uh, wind in 
even when you're adding new characters to the game. What the advantage of the uh, injunction or the enjoined process does is it means that a new player coming in doesn't have to worry about whether or not he's going to be recognized or he's going to have to prove himself in the first three seconds of a game because the players who are enjoined can instinctively identify and recognize new enjoined. And it's only the first couple... Go ahead. Yes. Hmm? Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yep. Happens all the time. Walking down the street and somebody goes, Hey! Uh, Greg, you know, let's say your character, what's your, what's your Zandrakar. What was his character name? Hey, Zandrakar. So long, we haven't seen, or Zandafel. Uh, we haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? You left us a couple of weeks ago, and we haven't heard anything from you. So, yes, yes, he's, he's rattling off the things that, that he does have to take into account when building a character, which is rules of the game, setting, themes, and of course house rules. I think it's really funny that he goes, "Oh yeah, and house rules." It's like, well, no, the house rules is probably the, probably the biggest part of it because how the how the game master runs the game is possibly more of an impact than even which which rule system you play. I mean, I played I played a campaign of um, uh, Warhammer fantasy RPG. I don't know if you've ever played it, but uh, the game master very very much had a problem with with trolls, and so we were every character was it was highly recommended that we play troll killers, and when nobody did, he was sad. It's like you're the storyteller. You 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 were making us feel like we had to play that and therefore we didn't want to it's like if you want us to play it then you give us reasons and let, let that go you don't have to hammer it through our heads mm -hmm. well i told you the beginning of nikos D, &D when when dungeons and dragons was first released player characters that were humans got no modifiers none you didn't get any human modifier you didn't get any learning skill check you didn't the only thing they had is they had unlimited advancement so they could be any level ever so they could play the 20th level if they wanted the D, D rules although they were aimed at 10th level didn't put a limit on humans but that wasn't enough of an incentive so my very first campaign everybody had told me i'm not bringing a player character that's a, a human and i said fine uh just so you know because nobody wants to play one this campaign is going to be run uh, that the world of Nikos is going to start off with no human beings whatsoever on the planet. So don't don't realize that if you don't play one now, there are there are not going to be any humans whatsoever. And every player showed up with a human. So my party of adventurers became a crew of a starship that crash landed as the first human beings on the planet. That was my very first campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lots of miniatures lots of miniatures Rule, rules lawyers or they want to be yep yeah. yeah so even when I I pick up starting points but every spell you have either find fire or steal Ah, that's that's an interesting way to do it. I've I've done similar. Uh, I always hated the auto uh, auto level up, and I also still I, I still hate the auto level up feature uh, feats and skills, uh, specifically the feats in Dungeons and Dragons, because I know players that grab feats out of thin air. It's like I'm uh, leveling up from level four to level five barbarian, and I want to take Chinese table ethic e e etiquette. Why? You're breaking up again. Yeah, the biggest challenge with the concept that you have there, Zen, is that sometimes the players will have the money and the access to a higher level spell, but the rules of the game require them to actually be able to cast a spell to be able to write it down so they can't even add it to their books. And I 
I reversed that. I said, if you can find a, a spell, you can write it down in your book, even if you can't use it yet. So, therefore, a character could have spell books that had six, seven level of spells that they would not get to for 20 years. Yep, now you're back to it again. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. They, they, all skills are derived from your foundation, and I've gone over the foundation with them, set the base numbers, so he understands that concept. Yeah, he was just saying that in one of his games, the game master didn't like the auto auto level up spell gaining, so he made it so the players could only add spells to their spell book if they found them, bought them, or stole them. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, I haven't, I haven't gotten to that yet, but the mechanistically, whenever you're doing any anything, uh, if you are uncontested, it's just a skill check against whatever the thing is. So, for example, if you are going to cast a uh, a a uh, produce food spell, you're going to make a meal for everybody. That's your point. You just roll against your skill at producing food. If you've got a skill for that, if you've got a magical skill for that, then sure. Hold against it. If it succeeds, it works. And more importantly, if it succeeds really well, you get an ample abundance. And even if you don't get it right, maybe you get some moldy bread instead of actual bread. <laughs> if you get a partial success, hey, it's something to eat, guys. We might be starving here, but at least I was able to produce something. You know, maybe it's a small portions, <laughs> whatever. But the idea is that you did get a get a, get a, get a partial success as an option. And then it's only when things are challenged that the numbers change. So if you're trying to do something that is a non-combat action, like picking a lock, and the guy is attacking you while you're doing it, and you decide, I just really want to get the lock picked, you still can still attempt it, but now it would be a challenge instead of a check, so it's much more difficult to accomplish. It's not impossible, and you still have a chance of getting a really good, really good or a partial success, but it's greatly reduced from what it would be if you were not being assailed by somebody with a sword. And combat is similar. You're, you're rolling for the success of your combat ability, not of the specific attack against his specific armor. So it's a much faster, more fluid game situation. But you can actually both get a partial. The idea is that if, you're, if you think about um, two guys fighting with swords, you get in close enough. If you get close enough to nick him on the shoulder, he might have gotten a nick on your arm. So that that can happen in an, in a an, in Nikos conflict, whereas it won't happen necessarily in a D and D one, unless there's specific micro call micro shark micro called shots and all kinds of nonsense. Okay, right. So when there's a relative success, uh, you've 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 succeeded and I've succeeded. The relative success matters so that if I get a, I only get a partial success against you, but you get a full success against me, you get to invoke a condition on the fight. Therefore, you can either do more damage because you landed your blow better, or you can push me aside, knock me off balance, knock my head weapon loose. You know, some other condition is added to the fight that I have to overcome in the next process. Right, it could be trip, trip and fall. It could be lose balance. It can be get, lose your footing. You know, if you're on sand or, or, or gravel, and even if you weren't, didn't think you were, you say you're fighting in the streets. I say, yeah, well, I've, yeah, that 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 uh, condition is that you've bumped into some debris that was in the street. Suddenly, now there's debris in the street. We didn't see it before, but you found it. Good job, because you in the fight positioned yourself to get to take advantage of that. So, it's some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, in addition, the the level of graduated success can increase the number of conditions. So you could actually get, say, you could get a, a wild success, and I only get a partial. That wild success, or even better yet, a complete success. You roll 
the one percent on the dice roll, which is the perfect roll. That one percent is a complete success. So it's complete success, wild success, normal success, clear down to my partial. That's three conditions. So that could be three times the damage, or it could be uh, damage to more than one location, or it could be uh, three separate conditions. You knock me over, push me down the road, and it becomes the John Wick combat scene where you're getting, you know, okay, you're having to roll away th uh, 30 feet down the staircase, you know, because <laughs> that's my condition I put on you based on the scene, of course. There has to be those items. Now, we haven't talked about one other thing, and that is the, the second thing that happens in Nikos RPGs is that there is staging. So the first stage of the fight will happen until certain conditions are met. So let's say you're trying to take a wall. You're trying to take a gatehouse, right? So the first thing you do is get to the gatehouse. You fight to the gatehouse, and your successes, you're moving forward, moving forward. Finally, you've ach achieved that. That, can, that now changes the stage of the fight to the defenders now to having to defend the wall with the wall defenses. So they're pouring down the rocks and they're throwing down the hot water and the acid or whatever. And you're trying to avoid that. And if you succeed over that, then you're able to push past those conditions and actually get the gate open. So a staged scene like that means that it's more dynamic. It feels like more accomplished, more is accomplished because each part of it is its own level of successes. And any time there's success, a success against a failure, the combat is over. That portion is over. So if I have attempted to get to the wall, or you have attempted to get to the wall, I fail, my guards fail, you succeed, you've made it to the wall. That's it. We're done. We don't have to go through any more rounds of combat in that. You've made it to the wall. So now the next conditions trigger based on that new status. So now you're up against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Lucid interpretation of spells, including animate. Yeah. Nice. Undead security camp. That's cool. That's good. Yep. Yep. F uh, that's called rule of cool. Your game master is I. I mean, he's a man after my own heart. That's that's the point of the game. Is is. If it, if if it, if you think is, it can work as a game master, then let the let it work. Yeah, I mean, I I would I despise or I I don't do well with the game master. He says, well, according to Animate Dead, you have to have a complete corpse, and it has to be all the bones, and all the bones can only form as the being itself. Blah blah blah. I really liked. Uh, did you see Hellboy? The uh, I think it's the first one. We just came around the. The dead corpse of the priest. Really, really funny. He's only carrying around the upper half. The guy was eviscerated. Whatever. Very, very funny. He's, he's continuing to talk to the animated skeleton. <laughs> he says, much later I animated a group of rats. Well, which, which game masters... Oh, yeah, the original, uh, very original Hellboy. Yeah. Oh, he's following the conversation. Yeah. So in, the, in that Hellboy, when he raises that priest, it's, it's a, that's a fun, fun interpretation of animated dead that once he animated him, he couldn't shut him up. <laughs> I'll just lay here. You just leave me here. I'll be fine. You have to ca cancel the spell, call, call, call it the curse, but let me go back and lay down and sleep again. The other thing to realize is that in, in, in the Nikos RPG, every time you use a skill... Oh, ads. I got ads. You got ads. We got ads. We're all got ads. Every half hour. It's called uh, Passage of Time. That's the only thing I can figure. Is it is it a half hour too much? I'll have to see whether I can change it. I don't know if I can. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> ah. <laughs> no, you did it again. No, no, I get it. I get it. I get it. It's just very funny. Oh, you did it again. Yep. I'm a, remind me that I'm a small streamer. <laughs> Commercials.
settings gotta be set. Some settings gotta be. It's got a button that lets me automatically run an ad break. Isn't that great? Automatically start an ad break. Yeah, no. Looking for the auto programming. No, Grace is actually Agility, Dex. Dex and Great, that kind of Grace. Yeah, well, yeah, it's also, it's sort of, it's sort of also the idea of Grace being lucky. Because if you're, you know, if you're particularly a, a dexterous, you tend to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're all they're all in there. Yeah, it's in the quick rules, in the instant rules, which are downloadable from nikosrpg.com. Ads. Oh yeah. Let's see how this works. I have to have four minutes of ads per hour. I have to see what I, let's see what I can do here. Yeah, I, I, and I, there's something I, I have to do that keeps me from having the pre-ads, which I, do, I, I hate pre-ads. Let's see here. How often would you like to run your ads on your channel? I would like to run it one per hour. Then it's eight minutes of ads. That's what it, that. Yeah. See, the least number of ads is actually if you run once every fifteen minutes, you only have to do four ads. Right. So, right. So, so, don't, so don't. So they, then, well, you'll you'll find that the uh, the the numbers that are on your on your foundation don't really matter at, at all. See, I don't get this mid roll ads, pre roll ads. I'm trying to figure this out. It looks like the if I if I control it down to four. Yeah. 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 I'll look at it. Apologize for it. causing any problems. Back. All right. So uh, yeah, the, the 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 foundational numbers are literally like the um, foundation stones of a house. We were talking about yesterday about a strong care, a, a strong house built on a strong foundation, uh, which is what G G Johnson quoted. Um, the point is, is that. You don't have to worry about them once you've developed any skills at all because the skill advances will outstrip it rapidly. You'll be much better off to use your actual skill than to depend on a die roll for, for, as you said, luck or whatever. And if you want to play as a quote, unlucky person or have mis misadventures or whatever, per adventure, we would call it, um, that's just a matter of how you play. I'm not going to, I'm not going to adjust uh, the game to make it harder or easier on you based on what your numbers are. You know what I'm saying? If that makes sense. Uh, luck is a stat in his game. Honestly, I tend to disregard it because mostly because even if you have a max level luck, there's still a chance that luck will not be lucky. 
I don't know. I don't know. I have players who took, like, for example, the Lucky Feet on Dungeons and & Dragons, and it made me so mad because they would have, I think, Lucky affords you three extra dice rolls and ignores ones. I mean, it, it's such a hedge against the kind of misadventures that are fun to play with that, to me, it was a, a burden. And even with that, uh, when I say that grace is luck, I'm only referring to grace as in the idea of uh, a rock falls off of a building and is going to smash down into you. Having a higher grace means that you're more than likely not going to be struck by the rock. This is dice is a matter of luck, and I know we all wish we could naturally roll all 20s without effort. Well, here's the thing. We all want to be able to adequately do our skills in game that we feel that they're meaningful. Otherwise, we wouldn't want to play the game at all. If, if I knew going in against a fight that the opponent was going to be able to hit me using standard die rolling, could hit me on anything above a 4, and for me to hit him, I have to roll above a 15, I'm not going to want to fight him. The odds are just not in my favor to, to win that engagement. But... Yes, see, that's because you also understand. We've already had this conversation. You, you, you comprehend role play for role play's sake. So, yes, there's a lucky feat in five e. Uh, the dex based thing. Right, exactly. When you level up, you can go get a feat, and one of the feats is lucky. And I don't think there's any restriction on who can have it. So. This barbarian was, yeah, this barbarian in particular was already resilient. He had a uh, 20 armor class and uh, his uh, strength and uh, proficiency bonus was plus eight. So it's very, very rarely that he would miss. But that brings me back to the point of the reason why the numbers here, if you look at the ones that I've arbitrarily put up there, they represent a target, a single target, but it, that's not how we actually roll the dice. And I, I, it mystifies, and it's easier to explain by play, so I don't know that I should say anything more. Strig, you can help me out here. Do I, do I mention quantum die rolling, or do I just let that go? Because <laughs> I know it's easy. Okay. Okay. Well, I've fortunately I've got my die rolling table up here, and I can actually show some examples on the dice. Might be able to be helpful. So the idea here is that when you're when you're going to roll dice in a conflict, you're going to roll, be rolling percentage dice in Nikes RPG, and obviously you have a target. So let's say this is a uh, let's go with Grace because it's ridiculous. Fifty five percent. Fifty five percent means most of the time you're going. That's a, just over half the time you're going. to Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, oh, yeah, copy. Oh, yeah, sure, you can copy and paste directly from, from the page. Yeah. Yes, any two word device. Yeah, but that would definitely. Oh, he says he can't hear you at all. Yes. Go double check. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, well, I'm seeing your, your line moving, so I just made yourself turn up the volume. Because if, if, if I can, yeah, unless it's how you've got it via stream. And you hear him now. And thank you for mentioning it. You His can name. hear it when my mic plays up when I've got to buy a new connection. Yeah, there, so. there we go. Oh, yeah. I just had to turn down too low. I think it's because the other day I was playing uh, my theme song as a back, back, uh, backing music, and I had it really down low, so that's why I was close. So he can hear you now, Strig. Okay. <laughs> so otherwise, no, uh, otherwise I was only talking to the, to my to my invisible friend, <laughs> Strigly. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm going to just make an image um, link via Discord and then drop it into your chat so we can see the different abilities. Sure. I mean, just just sort of what they represent. Sure. I'll just so ignore what I'm sending you. 
when I, when I, I won't I won't notice the text going by. No big deal. So, uh, using the grace of fifty-five, typical die rolling, you're going to roll the dice and then determine whether or not you succeeded or not. Now, because it's an intuitive die rolling system, the percentage is always going to be the low, the low number. So, twenty-six is lower is. than the fifty-five. So there's um there in Discord is a different like the abilities what are oh, what, what, what they what they were defined to yeah six of them I've done it yeah there's seven technically it's seven oh did foundation. I miss no you're okay. fine okay. foundation is built in so if you copied the whole thing it's there foundation is the average of the other six um yeah I didn't mention foundation but I mean I haven't copied that but I did the other six explaining what they were so ah and he just grabbed the text he's welcome to the text channel. Just, I, I put it in Discord to you and then just copy the Discord link. Right, and that, so that it, they can yeah, you. gotcha. Gotcha. He just, he just came out to the Discord to get it. So. Right. And I'm going to go. Uh, if, uh, if, with, if with your permissions, and I can also give you uh, access to to the rest of the Discord if you want to, let me know. Yeah, I'll recopy it and put it in then. Well, I'm just saying, if, if he does that, then I'll be able to uh, give him a, a role. That's all. Because he has to have a different role to be able to get onto the, to the chapters. Let us know you got it. Okay, there I'll we go. put it up. No, I got it. I just, he just gave me permission, so I'm just going to give him a roll. Okay, so now you can, should be able to access it. There you go. That way he can see the art gallery and everything. He's behind the wall! He's behind the wall! <laughs> yep. Um, and the Discord looks new because um, the, it got hacked recently. Yes. Yes, and so occasionally you hear Strigley make a joke about hacking the site or stealing my property. <laughs> it's an ongoing internal joke, but now you're in on it. It was um, yeah, a few days ago. Um... Oh, he's now also a follower. Yay! Uh, make sure you go over also and check out the YouTube site, which is at Nikos RPG as well, because there's a lot of videos that will explain a lot of this stuff for you. So yeah, know what's going on. But anyway, the twenty-six against the fifty-five—that's a—that's clearly a success, right? Because it's less than fifty-five. But check this out. Because we want to look at these numbers slightly differently, I want to give an opportunity for a partial success. So a partial success would be any number that is above the fifty-five. Obviously, that would be a, a regular success, but less than. Double 55. Of course, double 55 would be 110, which is impossible on percentage dice rolls, and the game has a cutoff of 95. What that means is that with a grace of 55, you can pretty much always do whatever you're attempting to do with dexterity. Cool. Another ad. Another ad. I'm sorry. Yes. Funny how mods still get them. You get, you get past it. You get the ads. You get the ads too. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. The, I mean, giving someone mod doesn't stop them getting ads, which is weird. I reckon it should give them. <laughs> you, you would yeah. think so. Yeah, but then then then, 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 then what would on. happen? Then what would happen is somebody would just go, uh, all my, all my, ad, all my people are mods, and if it makes everybody a mod, then nobody's a. I think it's limited to how many, but yeah. Yeah, when we get to a larger number, we'll probably be able to. Is that so? All right. So, um, but let's let's go with a different example. Let's say let's say instead we rolled that, an eighty-six. An eighty-six is over the fifty-five. So in regular game terms, if it was a D and D kind of a thing, if you're over the number, you would have fit. But in this case, 86 is still less than the 110, right? So therefore, it's a partial success. Yes, That's I did really see your message. 
did see your message in Discord. Thank you for that. Welcome and all of that. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, twenty years experience D and D. Nice. Which nice. mod? Yeah, I got a, I got quite a bit of experience modding too. Ooh. Ooh. Um. Wait, game dip. What's the game? I was just curious. Or, or you mean like the this uh, the custom game that you're making? That's not a tabletop. Oh yeah, he's talking about you. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just read through the um by. But anyway, my point is that with the 26, though, 26 doubled up would be, ah, uh, let me rephrase that. The uh, skills 55, half of that would be 27 and a half. And we have a 26 on the die roll. The 26 on the die roll, and I just mounted the put backwards. We have a 26 on the die roll is better it's lower than the halfway down so that's called a double down and that's a wild success so not only do you have a knowledge of a regular success but you have a knowledge of a really really good success called a wild success and you also have the level of a partial success so every die roll is generating more than one possible response and with that therefore you can do a comparison so if it was a dance off for example you were dancing against somebody else who had a skill of say 45, they would then make their die roll, and their die roll at 4, 37 would be a success. But you have a wild success, and therefore you'd be one level above them, and therefore you could invoke a condition on my dance-off. So now I'm going to have to dance with a broken ankle, or a bent ankle. Or uh, I think there's a chap there's a folder for non neko stuff now. So feel free to put it there. If it gets too excessive, I'll, I'll, I, I may have to remove some, but if you want to put some stuff up, sure. Uh, in the Discord, it's the... Where is it at? It was I thought oh he no he sent me, sent me a petition I thought he said that he did it and I was going how did you do that but yeah oh, okay so we're still setting that up yeah just one second Okay, there you go. Right, right under the art gallery is the non Nyko stuff. I feel like put, put whatever you'd like to put up there. And if it gets too excessive, we'll, we'll pull it down. But your model will come put up whatever. Uh, we are a community after all of game, game players and game designers. So more, more power to the more of us and all of that. So, so we, we do create, you're just putting things in general at the moment. So I put, I put uh, art, art gallery is art for Nikos, and uh, I'm going to be moving stuff that's non Nikos art, like uh, uh, Leo, the guy we talked to yesterday, um, was uh, the guy, the dragon art guy. We'll be moving his dragon art yeah. over to the non Nikos stuff. Even. Well, you could even call it off topic or something like that. That's sure. However, you want to. Yeah, I can change so, he, it. so he's just put for now. He's just put his um, his out of his own will, just in general chat. Okay, no problem. I'll move it later. Not a problem. Thanks. Oh yeah, cool. You gonna guess that's Will Danville? No, I don't look like Will Danville. No, I mean the program he is. Yeah, that's yeah. The program he used doesn't Will Danville. Don't think. Don't think. I don't know what graphics art program he's using. But if you're wanting to find a decent program, I recommend Wonder Draft. I know it's a poor fee project, but if you've seen the maps I do, I use those. Yeah, he said he's, he says it's not available. Looks. In fact, the text is written out that way. Oh, using Obsidian. Okay.
Yeah, well, you've seen the maps I'm building. Cost or a one-off cost, or is it a subscription? I don't know. Is it sitting under cost, or is it off cost? Oh, I see. Non Noko stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Yay. Oh, is it? Oh, I'm going to have to look into that. What's that? Because I, I use OneNote at the moment, but I wouldn't mind. Looking at Obsidian. Cool. Well, that's like we talked about the day. Once you find whichever medium you want to migrate everything to the same medium so your stuff doesn't get lost. <laughs> One of the biggest nightmares I had is that I was working in, uh, I don't want to say it, uh, I think I was Lotus 1, 2, 3. <laughs> If you don't know what Lotus One Two Three was, Lotus was a word was a uh, spreadsheet program long ago. It was a one-off brand, and it was you know it was cheap, it was easy to use, blah blah blah. And uh, at some point, Lotus got bought out by Excel or whatever, and vanished. And all of a sudden, I couldn't convert my files anymore, and everything I had to do, I had done. I had to go from print out again and type it all back in. <laughs> so make sure you keep your stuff in whatever medium run, running in con, uh, current. Ah, oh, the other thing we haven't really talked about yet is uh, uh, magic creation. Uh, you were talking earlier about learning spells and leveling and whether you got new ones automatically or whatever. In the world of Nykos, magic is everywhere. Uh, the sun itself, Nimbus, generates magicals that uh, bombard everybody all the time, every day. And so virtually any any being on the planet and have an access magic and uh, with that utility the um, player gets to pick what, what effects he wants to do and how he learned it. In other words you wish to learn a specific magical effect you find the person that can do that magical effect and if they are of high enough skill at it they can teach you and if not they can help you learn how to do it on your own. So, what base skill does magic um, coincide with? Which which particular skill? Yeah, is, is there a is it, like is it is it with grace? Is it with presence? Or is it not oh, related? Okay, to okay, that? no, good point, good point. Um, all, almost all of them will come from resolve, because you're actually having to concentrate and control the power of these magicals, which are energy particles, if you will. They come from the sun, and so they're highly active. And so for you to control them and make them do things, you have to have, use resolve as your base, your foundation. You can also do it with brilliance. So, for example, if you've learned a new way or you develop a new way to talk to the magicals or a, you've created a device, maybe you get it to work through resilience. So, for example, a person who's wielding a wand, if he created the wand, he can make, he can attune the wand to that particular uh, foundation. So it's not that it's ever limited to only being one way. But generally, just raw magic being loose, it's usually driven off of resolve. The um, discovery or the awareness or acuity to magic, like a detection or whatever, would obviously be driven by cognizance. It's your awareness. Uh, if you're a spell singer, 
It's going to be off of your singing ability. So singing ability is going to be off of your presence. Uh, if you are as a, a spell dancer, if you're casting magic through your, the dance moves that you make, then you would be doing it by grace. So every spellcaster can uniquely make his magics how he wants based on which school of magic, whichever idea of magic that he brings to the table and where he discovers it in game. So literally you can find there are, I think there are 20, 25 different pantheons currently in Nikos RPG. And then of course the players can create their own, their own beyond that. And every game master can create theirs as well. So. Right. And uh, as he mentions, his, the ones in his game are, are, are defined by class. And one of the reasons for uh, dropping the class concept structure is that very, very, li very few limitations in the real world keep us from doing things. So in other words, if I am a, uh, in the, today's modern world, uh, some would consider me to be a, a, a Christian evangelist because I will talk about my Christianity from time to time. And I am an evangelist, but that mean, doesn't mean that I am a cleric. It doesn't mean that I have, uh, the fact that I can weld does not make me a, a, a manufacturer or a blacksmith. Or another example is just because you're a monk doesn't mean that you can't be a builder or you can't be a, or be yeah. good at different other thick skills. Exactly. exactly. Like, yeah, who, who you, yeah, just who you're brought okay. up to be. To, to me, to me, a great example is from the, uh, the, uh, Chris O'Donnell Three Musketeers movie where Oliver Platt, uh, says, I'm of, I'm of amused to dance. And he gets up and, and he's a swordsman, right? Great swordsman. But he's a crappy dancer, <laughs> but he's still a dancer. He can dance. It's okay. He doesn't, you know, you don't have to be one or two to be able to do the other. You can, you're not restricted or limited. Of it. Um, also, because the advancements are always uh, are always on the player's plate instead of the storyteller or game masters, it means that as a player, you choose your own direction as far as what you want to advance. If you want to be a great so, swordsman, you actually find skills that would make you a better swordsman and work on those. So you keep track of it, track of it on your player? In yeah, the, yes. That player, so, it's, so, it's a, so it's a trust system? Uh, well, absolutely. Yeah. yeah if, if, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Just we just pointed out, if every number always meant that you succeeded, it wouldn't be any fun to play. So if a player shows up and he says, "Yes, I have a ninety-five in this skill, and I have a ninety-five in that skill, and a ninety-five," probably he's not playing fairly. And the only person he's cheating, cheating is himself, because he will always succeed at what he's doing. But the main thing is to realize that the game doesn't go by that; it's by success or failure. And even with a ninety-five percent skill, he still has a five percent failure because all he gets rid of are the partial successes. See what I'm saying? So you've got a, let's say you take a 95, you're 95% swordsman, and I've got a 5% swordsman. I'm only going to hit at most with a partial 10, 10%. And most of the time you'll win. You'll be able to whittle me down. But that's the way it would really be. A professional swordsman against a rookie would always win. Uh, but there is that one chance. He's got ads again. He's got ads. Okay. Really increase the adverts on Twitch. I'll see what I can do about that. I don't know that I can. I, think you, I don't think you can too much. I mean... Until I've like until I'm a big player, then I can go ahead. I run an ad blocker, and it often blocks them. But well, I can. I think I can set up so the subscribers don't have to see ads. Yeah, yeah. Subscribers don't. But subscribers have to pay a fee, so <laughs> I don't want to do that necessarily, yeah. especially as small as we are. The description itself is four ninety nine. Yeah. Uh, I think it's like eight dollars for me. Eight nine nine. Okay, that's good. That's good. good. So therefore a, a master swordsman 
still has a chance, 1 in 20, of being uh, defeated. Not 1 in 20, but the chance of him being wounded or losing the fight is 1 in 20. And a good portion of the of the story is, um, I mean, part of it isn't just the winning; it's a sexual story and being part of the narration. What's going on is a good part of the fun too. Yeah, it's uh, eight ninety nine, I believe. Uh, that's my driver. I think that's what it is. Seven ninety nine for it's me. Seven ninety nine. Seven ninety nine. And then it's and then I think it's five US for you. So it depends where the person is in the world. Well, that's probably why I said four ninety nine because I think that's what it is on the US side. I don't. Remember. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Subbing. Yep. And sub subs don't have to pay the don't have to watch commercials. Yeah, what you're saying. It's sad, sadly it's something that's just built into Twitch now. It's all about yeah. To it's, avoid it, it, unless you are a sub. Yep. And yep. like it's even thrown at me, and I'm a mod. <laughs> so it's like it's just something on Twitch's end. You can't really avoid it in streams. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, I get it. I I totally get it, and I don't mind taking a taking a minute break or over. I wish there was a way for it to flag me when it's going to commercial, so I could you know wind down before we get there. Right, right? Don't feel like you don't feel like you have to sub. Like you've just been here right. chatting and right. You know, it's, yeah, I wasn't suggesting. I was just saying, if if you were looking at trying to get rid of the ads, this my thing I was been. Look, I've um I've modded heaps of channels and uh, community, and I I don't really sub, but I'll give like I'm there talking and yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you still build to, towards the community by just being there and chatting. Absolutely, absolutely. Really appreciate it. I can, I can gift a sub to everybody. I don't. I thought I only, I'm only given so many, right? I think it does an ominous, doesn't it? With I'm not sure. I I've got a streamer I mod, and I think that he gives out subs sometimes. Because when I first, it, like, way back, he used to. I'd get an ominous has given you. No, sub, I've like, okay. So here's here's the kicker. The way they do it is I have to buy them. If I buy yeah. subs, then I can give them away. So I can. If I spent if I spent uh, four dollars, I can give away one. Well, that's obviously what I'm doing is I'm paying for that sub. But then it says if I want to buy fifty subs, it only costs me two hundred and forty nine dollars. Only. <laughs> yes. I mean, it costs you half that, right? Because like half that money goes back to you. No, that's me paying. That's how much I pay. Four ninety nine. Yeah, no, but you get money from the subs, is what I'm getting through oh. our own channel. Yeah, it's, it's a percentage, yeah. I think its partner um, can give a certain number, a, a few, couple of free subs a month, I think they get, that they give to their boss, and yeah. Maybe so. Because I can gift, gift anonymously, and... Yeah, but even with that, I've got it, there's a 499 fee. Okay. Yeah, they don't. This is Twitch. They don't do free. Hey, we don't do free. I mean, we we would, but I mean, Twitch doesn't allow free gift you know, subs. Yeah, and but the point is that I am not getting the four ninety nine. I promise you, it's not like oh, they're, I'm going to give the sub and they're going to give the money right back to me. That's not how that works. <laughs> that you works. get half of it, and then on top of that, you have to reach a threshold of so a certain many. amount of money. It's like a hundred and something dollars earned on Twitch before you can even get any payouts or whatever. Right, right. And that's a certain time during the month and things like that. Right, right, right. And. Uh... After you get to partner, I think there's even uh, even more ways for them to take money from you, but also better ways for you to make money. I think you can actually, I think at partner, you can actually choose the ads, the number of ads or whatever. And then there's also in-show advertising. I know people that do that where they'll, you know, make a sponsorship deal to show off a certain kind of dice or whatever. I remember with some partners, they approach them and they try and do ahead deals. Hey, we'll give you this amount of money a month if you do this amount of ads and stuff. So it's a lot of streamers that care about the community are like, I don't, I don't care, I don't want you to do. Right, exactly. It's like, I, I, why compromise? I, I, I don't I, want your $60 a month if it means my 
you know, hundred and whatever viewers have to watch been three, out, three times as many commercials. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other option is um, kick. A lot of people have been jumping to, or I mean, I got a number of people that jumped to kick. Jumped to, jump um, to kick. Yeah, I, I looked. I looked at kick myself. I did set up a, a kick account um, for Commander Clueless because there's a lot that 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 channel is a lot more a video game related than than Twitch is anymore. But a lot, a lot more exposure is still on Twitch because it's so much bigger. Right. 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 Enough talk about money. I don't like talking about money. I don't like it. I wish I yeah. wish money would go away. I think they, they, if we could all get back to a, a barter trade system, we'd all be better off. So I can find it. And like uh, Strig, Strig does a lot of great administrative stuff that I don't know the hell, what the hell to do. So I greatly appreciate all the help I get from that aspect. And so you yeah, know, good. the 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 concept of a of a hex that's got Strig's name on it is like obvious. You know. <laughs> I just, I don't know, it's sort of, um, well, Star Citizen Sin community was what I helped a lot, and I just enjoyed helping streamers and having them succeed, because it's almost, oh, it just makes you feel good when someone else has done well, when you've put into their stream or their, or the projects, you know. All right, you can do that if you want to join the, join the voice chat, you can do that if you'd like. I don't know if you want to, if we would talk, and it's like. Yeah, as long as it's time I mute the show. Um, be aware that um, you mute, mute the tab, not the stream, because if you mute the mute the um, the stream, then you don't count as a viewer. Right. Hey, right, you gotta you gotta listen through their software. Oh yeah, that's right. You're a mod, you know. He, he's a mod. Give yeah. him a break. Yeah, Come yeah. on, man. What's yeah, wrong I've with you? Wake up! I've got. <laughs> wake up! Wake up! Haha, ha, good. Wow, we're pushing uh, five hours again. Seems like every time I do these shows, they get longer and longer. <laughs> That's what happens when you talk to me. Uh, and I talk to anybody. Uh, actually, the way I say it is this. I don't talk too much. You all just listen too well. <laughs> so you're, you're fine at the moment? If but so, so I'm just trying to give an example when you become too technical when you're talking about things. Yeah. Like how you're talking now is good. Nothing. So I'm not sure if you can tell the difference or. or... I'm working on it. I really am mechanically yeah. working on <laughs> being better. Oh, that's why he said semi mute. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. I put it on 1%. Yeah. I was a big going nuts here in myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's no fun. I remember the first time we were streaming with Jean, and, and, and the poor girl didn't understand what we were saying. She kept saying, "Why? Why do you only talk once, but I talk twice? Talk twice? Talk twice?" <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Actually, you just turn it down in the browser. When they fully mix yeah, so therefore it's, it's blasting full full speed out of have Twitch, but it's going to a damper on the on the window side. Yeah, and then you realize at Gene's house that there's t uh, twenty people that live there, and you're on full blast all day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. She never signs out, so she's always here, having to hear all this. Is she? No, no. <laughs> If she, if, she, if she could get more Nikos into her life on a daily basis, I can't tell you. It was funny. It's funny. Um, during COVID, when I was running nine games, she was playing at the store with me already four days a week. And for that, for her to do that was a 37 mile one way drive for a woman with one leg to drive to come to play at a game store. And then I was switched to online, and all of a sudden she could access six games. Was, <laughs> I was never alone. Gene was on the Discord all the time, going, "What are we doing next? Are we playing again? What are we going to play now?" Da, da, da. It's like <laughs> it didn't matter either. I could play post-apocalyptic and play uh, you know, Driftwood Saloon, yeah. 19, uh, 1860s, you know, Wild West. She was going to be there. She she didn't care either. She played some racy roles, man. Scary, scary stuff. 
She played a, uh, uh, she had double derringers and uh, she kept them in her bodice and she was a madam. It was like, no, just, no, I, I, not, I don't need that visual. You're 78, Gene. I don't need this visual. I'm going to see someone break into a house and she'd be like, I know everything I've learned from Nike. So go, don't stand a chance. Well, then I, I think I told you the other day that I that she accidentally left her phone on after finishing a conversation with me. Yeah. And I could hear her. It was on a Discord call and she was already playing. And I got out of it. I asked her later how that game went. She says, oh, we didn't stop until about 10 p.m. Well, that was at 8 in the morning that I talked to her. So she ran the entire day. Yeah. She's like living there now. Oh, nice. I want to find that. Um, I want to find a program that stops my Twitch from pausing if I'm playing a game. I mean, I'm not at the moment, but if I'm doing something else, the tab just decides to lower quality and freeze or whatever, or just pause. Mm -hmm. I still want to be able to hear the audio. Yeah. Well, when I got started, I didn't understand that that I had that my microphone wasn't. I mean, that my microphone could be a uh, speaker, and I accidentally set it up so that it was a speaker. So it was a speaker and a microphone, and so everything I said was feedbacking within the microphone. You can actually do it with your headphones, right? Set up one one as a mic, and the other one as sound. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I got right now. Well, I mean, one one ear. I mean, like one ear is microphone and one sound. I believe you can sit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll be watching the a video fine, but mm -hmm. as soon as I load up a game, and I could have that game running in the background, but as soon as I'm going off that browser, the browser that's like the computer just goes, "Oh, you're not prioritizing it anymore. I'm just going to freeze it a bit." Mm -hmm. I'm going to put it on pause completely. And I, it used to not do it with Twitch. Now it does. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I have created, I'm like, I have fiber. Like I have really good speed already. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, I have I have pretty good speed. And I've got a really good processor, so I, 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 I my machine yeah. run, runs pretty well. I mean, I'm so running. I'll be utilizing just a small amount of it, and it still freezes it. Hmm. So, uh, uh, have you thought about Nyko Smirch yet? What's that? Have you got Nyko's merch planned? Um, I've got a couple of things. The 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 um, the mouse pad and the posters. But the posters really, until until they until people embrace the uh, pantheons, the the posters are just pretty things. My nephew's a great oh. artist. This guy behind me, the picture on the wall back there, is one of my twenty inch posters. Nice. I was thinking you could always got an advert again. Or oh, I've got an advert. I don't know if he does. If he doesn't have one right the second, he will have a few. Probably. Yep, yeah, he's got it. Yeah, hit the ads. Okay. I'm going to sit and talk for hours and hours and hours. It's supposed to be 50 seconds. That's ages. Wow. 50 seconds? Yikes. Okay, I'm good. I'm not sure. If... Could you make your merch... Um, could you make the Nikos logo into a badge? Yes. I already can. I want to make it into a printable badge. As a matter of fact, I have an idea that I would like to run up a flagpole to make sashes. Look, and I know you probably already got one. Where's, where's the Nikos tattoo? 
<laughs> I don't. I, I, I have, oh, I'm disappointed. I, I have no ink. I have no ink. No, no, nowhere. <laughs> Not even on my hip. No, no. <laughs> Welcome to the channel, by the way. Voice channel. Then. Hello. I'm, I, uh, really, really vo low volume. I'm Jonathan, by the way. I just go by Xanderthal. Still really low volume. Have to boost him on my end, I think. Yeah, yeah I have to on my end. I can't really, uh, like, try to turn up my volume on my end, but. No, no worries, no worries, we can do it on our end. Going back down. We can do it on ours, no big deal. I didn't, it's still quiet, but I can hear. You yeah. Can still hear what you say. I've just 200 boosted you. Yeah, we're just really loud people, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, what part of the world are you in? Because we're right now. We're pan global. Uh, Strigley's in New Zealand, and I'm in Southern California. Oh, I'm in New Mexico. Oh, so you and I are so far away. Yeah. Although I honestly wish I lived somewhere else. <laughs> well, I think I th th there's there's part, there's sometimes that I think that is the truth of every human being that wherever we are, we're not where we want to be. Or where I don't we know. Think we I like be. I like New Zealand. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're safe from nuclear winter. You're you're fine. All the rich people are going to be around you when it's all done. And the nukes go off, and the bombs drop, and the ice shelf falls off in the ocean, and all of those horrible things. It's more. It's away from the crazy. Actually, ice shelf is close to us, so it's <laughs> if there's ice shelves everywhere. We're just going to flood. Exactly. We aren't going by uh, fallout rules. <laughs> nuclear winter. Yeah. True. Fallouts. Um, it's like uh, when the bombs fell. Um, suddenly the entire world is um is blanketed in in nuclear fire. Yeah. Well, it's a great visual. We've all seen those pictures of the of the fire starting on one place and spreading across the globe. Visually, it's kind of a cool image. None of us want that. <laughs> None of us want that. <laughs> but, yeah. Um. Even um, the um, realistically speaking, mm -hmm. even the largest bombs um, that uh, that Russia has, mm -hmm. they would still need at least like roughly a million of those SAR bombas just to blanket all of the Earth. Right, right. That's assuming that they were crazy enough to do that. Well, and I think the real thing is that people just don't have a real good in, uh, concept of how big this world really is. Um, I mean, I live in Southern California, and so there's millions of bodies near me, you know, relatively speaking. But if I drive from here to Barstow, there are you know, miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of square acreage that is not being used for anything, and the world needs them. To produce the, the air and all of that kind of stuff so it's just that we don't think about how big it is we know how close we are to our friends we know how tight the world is around us but we don't realize how really loose the world is well, in terms of overall population there's where people can live and where they can't right well, there's, there's, there's you know people close to water sources coastal streams mm -hmm. and then there's other areas where people aren't and people forget that there's just these big open yeah yeah well, even I look in Australia, like most of it, we've got a few coastal areas and then it's a huge inland and no one lives there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I pretty much I'm read up on like uh, what's over in Australia. And uh, um, I swear, I'm like, um, you guys um, act like uh, like most of the, uh, of the animals that live in your, in your guys' country um, is like, eh, it's nothing. Um, I'll, I'll try not to. Um... Um, New Zealand and Australia are, are very different environments and countries. No, we think you're all alike, just like you think we we Americans are all alike. <laughs> yeah, but America's America. It's like it's all connected to the land there. But Australia and New Zealand, it's whole different climates, it's whole different species. It's... Yes. Yes. And this so is where dry this, and we're this, like This is where Strig says, Yeah, and we're prettier and we smell better. <laughs> New Zealand was land of the birds and like no snake. Well, we get yeah, we got no snakes. I mean, they you and they're I basically you, everything kills them. The you in Ireland, no snakes in Ireland either. 
we're we're quite a wet climate where Australia is very dry. So it's very. I mean, we're close, but we're a lot different. Just like it, only different. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I heard on that uh, New Zealand is also um like um typically used um for like a lot of Hollywood movies. <laughs> um. Yeah, well, the landscape is pretty nice. Like like anything, it's not as clean and green as it's made out to be. But there are areas that are still like breathtaking, amazing. Mm-hmm. And also, the whole Hollywood movie thing as well is we've got Weta Studio, which is like we've got a really good like movie production company that is just crazy good. They're good at just making realistic sculptures and where it looks like there's a person there and just generally mm-hmm. movie assets. Is one of our strong points with well, that company is really good with. But we've got some pretty good directors like um, uh, like uh, Thor Ragnarok and all that was. Was I forget the director's name? Yeah, no, I shouldn't. Uh, don't forget uh, Lord Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I've cl- I've climbed um Mount Doom. I've climbed Mount Doom. Did you find any rings laying around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't climb it anymore because of cultural reasons. That was damaging the mountain. Because bits would fall off, and it was a bit of a hazard and things like that. But... Yeah, don't want to don't want to ruin that track. We might have to make a sequel. Okay, yeah, so the actual mountain they used and said, "Hey, that's Mount Doom." Yeah, hmm. did not know on that uh, the, that Mount Doom um, was uh, was an actual mountain that was being used. <laughs> yeah, it's um, Narahoe. It's a moldy word, so good luck trying to spell that. You know what uh, the actual name of the mountain is uh, in Lord of the Rings? Oh, is it not Mount Doom? Is there actually another? It's got a it's got a dwarvish name, I think. Oh, I haven't actually, I haven't read the book series. I mean, <gasps> heretic. <laughs> what just because I'm from New Zealand it doesn't mean? It has to be. I mean, I like Lord of the Rings. I hated The Hobbit. But... Oh, okay, you know, I hate I hated the Hobbit movie. Yeah, Erebor. I mean, I hated the Hobbit book too. What? Erebor. <laughs> now you're upsetting me. You 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 haven't read the Lord of the Rings, but you've read the Hobbit and hated it. That that makes no sense. Oh, I read like half of it. It got this is predictable and boring. I can't read this. Oh, here we go with that boring again. Yeah, yeah. You'd be loved in the in the uh, literature appreciation class right there. But it's, it's not fun when it's when well, I know what's going to happen. To be fair, the Hobbit story um was actually originally designed for kids. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a it's a it's a bedtime story that he wrote he wrote for his kids. Didn't they stretch out the Hobbit with like the movie. other notes of his that were yeah the movie so stretch the, out the, the movie. movie with notes he had lying around and they they did they basically ring ring rings of powered. The Hobbit. They, they they put way too much junk in there that didn't need to be, and tried to tie stuff to to the Lord of the Rings that didn't need to be. I mean, there were scenes with with uh, Legolas, and 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 and, and it's like, wait, he's not even that that part of the story. Come on, get him out of there. There's another elf instead. You know, <laughs> there were more elves in El- in the Lord of the Rings than the five we get to know because of the movie. Oh, please. If it wasn't like Game of Thrones where the where the series got ahead of the books. Well, that's a problem only because Martin's a piker as far as a writer's concerned. He only writes a thousand words a month and that's ridiculous. I when I was when I was at my peak when I was pumping out uh seven books a week or six books a week, I was uh operating at about uh twelve thousand words a day. And he was doing a thousand words a month. Yeah, from what I gathered of like uh, the uh, type of writer that uh, George R. R. Martin is, mm-hmm. um, he's actually considered uh, a pantser, and basically, pantser means that the writer um, is writing on the fly. They don't really know what's going to happen, whereas Tolkien was a planner. He knew exactly what was going to happen as he wrote it. Right. Uh, and you, when you say pantser, I now realize what you mean. Pantser is in seat of the pants. Yep. Okay. I'm, I, as far as game mastery, I'm a seat of the pantser too, but I'm a seat of the pantser who did the planning long, long ago. The original arc of the Nyko story was finished when I was 17. 
And so now I re reiterate the story over and again, and we're, we're now into the ninth iteration of the story. So the players that are playing in Nyko's Dark Shards are playing in the world under the ninth cycle, ninth grand cycle. And so each iteration of play before has left Easter eggs in the game from what players did as a result of my story storytelling. But I can actually see to the pants run because the entire world has been predictable and planned. So I, I try to be the best of both worlds. But yeah, no, no. The thing with, with, with Martin is that Martin isn't, uh, uh, as you say, not a planner. He doesn't have the idea of what he's trying to go for. Whereas Tolkien, he, Tolkin had an agenda when he built And Martin also has to be making characters all the time because he kills them off. Well, that's an Amer that, that that's a modern American thing. We 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 got so we like killing people. <laughs> we, yeah, well, we... uh, Martin's idea is that uh, um, there should um, not be like any uh, um, characters with plot armor. Um, they call the Starks. The Starks have plot armor. But they all got dead. Really? That's they 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 weren't they weren't protected by it per se. John was for a while, but his, his his reason for being so was coming up with the with the winter. So. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, uh, um, the move uh, the, the the TV show uh, did um, do a heck of a lot of uh, changes um, from what the books actually said that happens. Right. <clears throat> Although no one really knows in the books. What is actually going to happen to John? Um, like, like they, like the, um, he was killed in the books, right? But the bit somewhere he comes back to life—that's TV show. Yep. Um, that's actually where Martin left off at mm -hmm. in the books. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a bunch of speculation as to like um as to like what will actually happen like. Um, there's a possibility that some um, he might be resurrected, but as something else. Like right. there's some uh, legend um, going uh, going about some about some uh, celestial being or whatever called Azura High, mm -hmm. and that being is like supposed to be a representation of fire. Right. Well, I, 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 one thing that I noted is that you can see the difference between uh, a writer still having his hand at the helm, even if he's not a very good writer, compared to uh, writers and publishers that are at the whim of the uh, money guys. Because when they did Rings of Power and House of the Dragon side by each, there wasn't for me any comparison. I was watching... Uh, dragon all the way through because that story still felt like the story was what was important not agenda you know that not... i didn't like the time jumping for house of dragon i well okay there was a reason they didn't announce it yeah but they didn't right. say what was going on oh exactly say, no exactly 20 years later well, and the switch out of the of the character between the first two episodes to the the final character for uh the Name. Targaryen one. I, was, I was fine. I was fine with time jump. So I just wanted them to say how long it'd be. Right. They needed a, some subtitles or narration or something. I was in the character, and then the actors are changing because they've got older. And that's what I meant. That's that was that the one that got me the most. Yeah. The most jarring is the one where she was uh, affirmed to be the uh, heir, and then the very next episode she's giving birth, and it's a different woman. And I'm going, who is this? It's like, why do I care that this woman is giving birth? Oh, that's her. What? Not even the same girl. Oh, six years later. Okay, I didn't understand. Yep, you're right. Yeah. That was that was problematic. Now, from a storytelling standpoint, it was interesting because um, if you go back and look at older authors, oh gosh, who was it that wrote um, Hawaii and? bunch of the really, really big books back in the old days. He did the same thing, where he was telling a life-spanning story, so your character would be 17 in one scene, and the next time you see them, they're 30. Like, wow. Because he's showing not the investment of the character, but the investment of the story, which is bigger than the people. 
think his name is James. James. Yeah, from what I gathered of like uh, of the entire freaking world of uh, for I don't actually know what what the hell he even calls it um, for um, what the actual world is even called. Um, I know he calls them that that the uh, that the continents are, uh, are are called like Westeros and Essos, but I don't know what um, what the actual world is called. Um, but. There's like so freaking much um, that 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 is in the in in the books um, that is not even mentioned in the TV show that yeah. it's like, um, uh, I mean, the amount of detail that that, that he put in, in into his books um, is or it, in, into every single country and whatever is bloody ridiculous, even for one man. Um, Apparently, it doesn't actually have a name. The world. Is that, you, they just call it the you, world. Or the... Yeah. Hmm. yeah. I guess um, he um, preferred some like simplicity on in, in that. Well, I don't think I don't think when you're talking about uh, people living in that era, they might not have ever considered anything beyond what they could reach east and west, and so not not a name for the world, because the idea of uh, this world being called Earth, I don't think there's even anything in the Maybe I'm mis mistaken, but I don't think it's in the Bible. Earth is it, other than the word that Earth means soil. Earth. Yeah. So I mean, uh... science world, science world had to go to naming it when they started naming the planets as our equal. That while the planets were still uh, messengers of the gods passing through the heavens or whatever, then the world was the world. Well, I heard that. Um... Uh, there is like a couple extra names, like um, for Earth, you know, our real r real world Earth. Right. Uh, one Terra. of them is is Gaia, and, and the other is Terra. Right. And one one is uh, actually taken from the god of the Earth, Gaia, and Terra is actually just the Latin word for dirt. So. <laughs> Yeah. Dirt, dirt, and Terra and Earth uh, are all all mean the same thing. Just they, but Gaia is the uh, actually the spiritual godly relationship with Earth. Literally, the name of Mother Nature. Yeah, I mean, like, um, the only other time that I actually um heard Gaia even used them was like from the Greek Titan. Mm -hmm. um, even though he, um, she was like, she didn't really play much of a big it's role. More... In, in, there's, 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 there's other ones like in Maori, it's Papa Tuanuki. Yeah. There's what? <laughs> he's messing with Maori, these... it's, it's Papa Tuanuki. You know, he's got, well, he's, he's, he's using a language. He's, he's attacking us with language. Make your defense. Yeah, Make your defense roll. <laughs> oh, quick. Uh, I'm checking against brilliance. You're too late. Ah, uh, 20. Now oh, I got a success. I, 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 I maintain. We're good. We're good. Because I, I got what you were saying. You were saying it's in, in Maori, and, and I'm pronouncing that name wrong. Maori, right? Maori. Yeah. Maori is like Maori. you're trying. Maori. Roll and roll. They are Maori. <laughs> oh, what was the other word we were talking about the other day with uh, uh, Stone Cap, Papa Rock Cap? Papa Tui? Papa Tuanuku. Papa Tui. I swear, it sounds like um, like like a grandpa's name. Papa too. He's the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> your dad doesn't make it. You go to Papa too. That's your. Oh, that's what it is. It's your stepdad. Papa too. It's like, and then you. And then that's then links him with the Sky Father. Mm -hmm. Well, also, cool. um, I guess some um, the Norse the. Uh... They also called it uh, Midgard. Mm -hmm. So that's where that's the, the, that's where he drew Middle Earth from. So that's what Midgard was, just the middle, they placed between. Well, for uh, for Tolkien, uh, he actually um, called his uh, world uh, Arda. Mm -hmm. um, Isn't Arda one of our oh, ERD? I believe is. Erd? No, it's uh, A R D A. Right, but he's saying there's also Erda. E R D. E R D A. Yeah, there's several here. You've got Telus, right? Yeah, Telus. 
heaps of them, eh? Like, whole different cultures have a whole heaps of different. Right away from George, Art. I can't even pronounce a whole lot of these. Yeah, well, that's actually what's really funny is that the name Nikos, I, I devised that in 75. And I originally was going to make it a dream world. I wanted, to, I wanted the entire fantasy setting to be in the world of dreams. And so I originally, at, at, at the tender age of 12, first named the world Narcos, N-A-R-C-O-S. And if you think for two seconds, that ain't going to work because that means narcos, which <laughs> drugs. It's like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> so narcos became nikos. So it's like, okay, well, I was still trying to capture the idea of, of, of a dream state. And nikos, N-Y-C-O-S, I believe, is, uh, has a Greek uh, root that has to do with, with darkness. But that was originally what it came up with. And uh, uh, Gene and uh, one of our other players came up with the idea that Nikos is actually an acronym for not your clumsy old system, or conversely, now your choice of systems. <laughs> not that not that I have any designs on on the world or anything like that. That would change the plan of it. So you're a night owl yourself normally, Sam? Uh, yep. I pretty much uh, sleep whenever my body tells me to to sleep. Uh, um, I've tried um, to uh, keep it to a consistent uh, schedule, but uh, every single time my body always um, reverts. Uh. When I, when I was when I was in the work world, I was a, an air traffic controller. That was one of my jobs, and my my schedule rotated: two day not two day shifts, two swing shifts, two mid shifts, a day off, and over again. And so I got to where sleep was no 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 stranger to me because I could sleep at the drop of the hat. I can just go over and crash and take you know, four hours, but I don't sleep anymore either. When, once I started writing as an occupation. Um, I write when I when the muse is striking me, and I don't stop until it until I'm ready to pass out, pretty much. So. Hmm. Well, to me, uh, um, well, for me, anyways, I'm like, uh, um, I actually always had a had a problem being awake in the day, <clears throat> and. I honestly um, think um, that uh, that I was just simply born on the wrong side of the planet. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> like, um, so, so it sounds like a, it sounds like you're moving to New Zealand. <laughs> well, Wait, why are you born on the wrong? I was, I was watching something. Oh, because oh, wow. he, he said he doesn't do well during uh, daylight hours here. And he thinks he was born on the wrong, uh, wrong continent. Be with it. Sun is up in the oh, other yeah. half of the day. It's eleven thirty PM here, so Yeah, but it's uh almost five in the morning here. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, it's five thirty where I am. But pretty much I'm like uh Almost I, Thursday here. I typically always woke up um like around nine or ten o'clock at night. Um, and I typically, like, go to sleep, like, around, um, like, noon. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, like, um, my internal clock, um, is apparently, like, um, better aligned with, like, either Australia or, or Europe. Mm -hmm. Um, even though it's like I've never left the U.S. ever. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm the other end of that spectrum. I moved forty times before I was eighteen. I went to twenty-two different grade schools and six different high schools across eleven states. Since then, I've lived in forty of the fifty states and on six of the seven continents. 
including Australia for a very short period of time in Perth. Oh. Oh, well, makes mistakes. Like I moved <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I miss I miss miss perfection by what a couple hundred, three hundred miles, whatever it is. To... Yeah, I know. <laughs> you almost got there. Like good try, but you just didn't just roll hard didn't enough. Just didn't get there. Nice. Darn it! I got a partial success. <laughs> no, that's not a partial. That's a fail. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, Perth was okay. I had good air conditioning. But yeah. j jumping and trying to land on the rock and landing near the rock and still injuring yourself is still is still a fail. <laughs> uh, for me, um, if uh, if I were to, if I don't move from my current location for like another, um, for another four years, my age will have finally caught up to the amount of times I moved. Ah. This is the part where I say I'm in the same city that I've been my whole life. That's the, yeah, that's really, lived in. what blew my mind was when I was in New York City and I found there were people that never left their block. I actually ran into people who lived in New York City in a high-rise apartment that had a grocery store on the main floor and they had dentists and medical stuff, whatever, and they never left their block, ever. Their I've been life. around New Zealand, like, well, you know, road trips and all the rest. But yeah. I've been in the same yeah, city my whole life. For me, I've only I've only lived on the west coast. Uh, I mean, like New Mexico is the furthest east that I've ever been. Mm -hmm. I've never gone any further. You're not missing much going east of east of New New, New Mexico. I lived in Texas for a while. Lived in Louisiana. Lived in Florida. Yeah. I'll give two hoots for that. I don't need the wet and the buggy. I say it's muggy and buggy. I don't like either one of those. I hate all the mosquitoes and cockroaches, water bugs. In Texas, they don't call them. They're, they're okay. They're cockroaches there that are four inches long, but they don't call them cockroaches. They call them water bugs or palmetto bugs. I'm telling you, it's the biggest damn cockroach I ever saw. It's, it's bad when the cockroaches want to arm wrestle you for lunch. <laughs> No, I'm not getting in there. I'm not, I'm not walking over there. No. Because over there, they've got flying cockroaches now. I have yeah. a beetle that's built, looks looks like a cockroach, but its wings fold over kind of like a grasshopper. And it can actually fly. No. So you're not referring to uh, hissing uh, cockroaches? No, that's a different breed, too. Yeah, those are, those are creepy. Don't want any of that. That's why the villains on Nikos, the primary villains are the are the Arlum, the bug people. Nobody likes them. <laughs> they make a my perfect primary, villain. My primary villains in uh, um, in my world are called the Daytross. Mm -hmm. Um, they uh, they they're a sub race of another species that's. Um, that was the first created in the world. Mm -hmm. However, most of the world doesn't even know that they even exist. Right. Um, basically, I call them the Zinselu, mm -hmm. the very first created. Mm -hmm. They're more alien in appearance. In appearance. Mm -hmm. um, like, like, um, you know how, how how our bottom part of our uh, of our heads is round. Mm -hmm. Well, for them, the upper part of their head is more triangular. Mm -hmm. They have like um, two sets of horns. <clears throat> they have scaly skin. They have like four fingers. Mm -hmm. And they have dragon like feet. And they also have a tail. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And also um, the other main bit about them is that uh, uh, they have two sets of eyes and they have breathing tubes coming out of their backs um, which they um, one set some uh, of, of tubes coming out of their back is for them to exhale the other set is for them to inhale they mm -hmm. don't breathe through their mouths mm -hmm. or their nose mm -hmm. but They've never ever left their community since they were created. Oh, they're New Yorkers. 
pretty much uh, they've uh, they live in an under um in an underwater cavern mm -hmm. uh somewhere in the oceans mm -hmm. and the only way that you could even access this place is if you took a ship um like out into the middle of the ocean and then like dove like about some um, several hundred uh, feet underwater and then you'd probably find their community that's it but yeah they've never left it <laughs> they have they never found a reason um to leave it uh, how are they, how are they the villains if they're there that far away no um the Zin Salu never left. Oh, okay. Um, I got you. Good day. The, uh, the, the good good created beings stayed where they're supposed to. Bad created yeah. beings went to the and changed. Yeah. Gotcha. Pretty much the Daytross um, are are a subspecies of the Zin Salu. They did used to live with them, but then they split off because they wanted more. They didn't want to pay uh, rent anymore. <laughs> well, not really about rent. I know. I'm they just... But Generally, the Zen Salo don't really have like a monetary system. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the you should hear brought, about they, they left and they uh, colonized them like a continent, and they just kept on breeding like more and more and more until to where they outnumbered um, their progenitor um, species, and. Eventually, they were they gained access some um, to some dark powers. Tora rift um, in, in in the um, in space um, time or whatever, mm -hmm. and then after that they invaded another plane of existence, mm -hmm. which belonged to the very being that that gave them that power. <laughs> after that. They essentially became gods at that point. Gotcha. Um, yeah. The, 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 the Nyko story was much simpler than that. When I was when I started out uh, as a game master, I was just running the old. Uh, and, you know, as, at eleven, twelve years old, you just as, as you will do, you'll sit and draw maps, and players will you know go call, crawling through your dungeon crawl and killing the monsters and stuff. And it didn't take me very long to think about the reality of how the heck did a dragon, a 40-foot dragon, get into that 80-foot room through a 5-foot corridor? You know, why? Why is it there? What's going on? And so I started building out. And the initial arc was basically finding, finding out that the dragons as the top of the heap weren't actually the top of the heap. They were actually being farmed by weaker beings that were stealing their eggs. And so the whole campaign was trying to rid the, rid the world of these uh, evil people that were taking the magic of the universe from the eggs and therefore depleting the dragon population. And when we finished that arc, um, the realization that the players wanted to actually consider a different way of solving it, and they did, was how I got started with the idea of a second iteration. So we literally took the Riddles and poems from all of the different um, pre-written dungeon—I mean, pre-created dungeons that I'd made, because I didn't have any of the books as a twelve-year-old. I didn't have the resources to go buy the player's handbook or anything. And when I when I first started playing, there wasn't any such thing. And when they finally came out, I wasn't able to get them for a while. And so the second iteration became the a pursuit. Uh, along the lines of a Tolkienian adventure, because uh, again, twelve-year-old brains, it's now seventeen-year-old brain. Yeah, we want to have a grand, grand, great adventure. We want to go get super weapons because that's what you're going to do. A combination of like the Power Rangers aspect at the time, the what was it, uh, the robot that became multiple robots. Uh, gosh, I can't think of what it was called. But there was a TV series about that and all that. So the the players wanted to. Get these grand items and so we found a, a device that opened the gates that would allow humanity to return to earth because they had gotten lost in space or whatever <coughs> and um once they got this device then they found it could be used for multiple things and got crazy after that so 
each passageway through time would use this device differently. So the first time through, it made a gateway. Second time, they made a, a weapon, a great weapon out of it. But when they built the gateway, the wrong thing came through, and instead, they instead of facing against the enemy as a species, they thought, oh no, just like uh, heroes always do, we're going to ask the universe to give us more powerful things, and so they opened the gates and let beings from other worlds come over. And those beings became six different species, and the six different species were the villains for that iteration, and so on. And so each iteration got its own challenges from the use of the device, however they chose to use it. And so that's really the engine, is that the players have always had agency, but the story still has its chronological checkpoints. Hmm. So, Sounds actually like a combination of uh, um, Star Ocean, uh, Chrono Trigger, and possibly some little bits of uh, Warhammer 40k. Chrono Trigger, yes. I... <laughs> well, did you, did you ever play Chrono Cross? I, I, I haven't played any of those. Uh, Warhammer, I did late, 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 uh, way well into the seventh iteration before I bought my first models. But um, yeah, the the concept of the story is is uh, that if time if time is linear and 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 time is uh, therefore if time is infinite and linear then why can't that line be a circle and therefore it's not that it's like wheel of time that you must do it in a certain way because that's just what's going to happen instead it's when you come back to the same point will you have the same perspective and so the arc's long enough that the player memories fade and the uh, each of these arcs is longer than the lifespan of any given group of characters. So, each... so every NPC is also in a different perspective as well. Then. Right, exactly. So even if even if the same name comes up again, you know, if 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 you met a guy named uh, oh, uh, Zendikar and in uh, a certain place in the world, and then. Ten years later, another player runs into a Zendikar. The Zendikar probably it doesn't even know anything about the original because the name is the only thing that's stuck around. And it's never, it's like I said, it's never that the that the individual pieces of the arc must be replayed. It's just that the pieces of the arc must be played through. There must be a resolution from it. I think my cat wants out. Yeah, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's almost five. I need to get to actually get off and go do some other things, so I'm going to be bailing in a moment. Yeah, I'm going to go, too. It's almost 12. All right, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys for uh, for coming and chatting. Thanks a lot for the, the follow. I appreciate it, Zend Zendifel. And uh, you're more than welcome to... Whenever you see me in the in the, in the voice chats, I'm either in the... Uh, um, Water cooler, I'm here. If I'm in the water cooler, we're not online and we can say whatever we want. But if you see we're in the online box, we've got to be careful. Be politically right. correct and all of that. So, um, if you want, you can give, have a look on Saturday as well. Yep. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you can, if you can't come in Saturday, otherwise we will see you every night. I'm on at 11 p.m. So, see, right. see you soon. Have a great night. Yeah, have a good one as well. See ya.